there's people that will have uh, psychedelic experiences and be like, oh, I saw God. But the fruit of their life is not like one who has had a conversation with God. They're not like suddenly directed on a path that's leading to life. They're like looking to recreate that experience over and over again. And I've, I've seen over time, they typically get more lost than found. Thank you for being here, Morgan. It's so good to see you. I w wanted to invite you to be a guest because of just how inspiring I find you. Oh, thank you. And, you know, all the different parts of your life. And today we're going to talk a lot about faith, uh, which is the through line that connected us. Yeah. But I just first want to really acknowledge you for just being who you are and living your truth. And I, yeah, I just find you very very inspiring and i think of you as a artist with a capital a and and a messenger of god and a lovely human being oh thank you I also share just quickly like the context that i have all these conversations in um you know i do a prayer sometimes before or even like now <laughs> which is you know I, I ask god um that that he allowed, you know, the the wit, the humor, the stories, whatever that needs to come through us that's going to make a difference for whoever's listening. So, yeah, uh, well, we ask that amen. That happen. Amen. That's great. Yeah, man. So, um, I want to start off uh, with your childhood because you didn't necessarily have the nicest childhood. Well, and, uh, I had moments of a really nice childhood and I had moments that were really difficult too. But take us there because I think that context um, is really important when we frame up who you are as a man. Sure. So uh, I was born in France to a, uh, a Michelin starred chef. We had a... Uh, well-known restaurant in uh, on the Bay of Saint-Tropez when I was a little kid. And about a year before I was born, my mom tried to figure out whether or not she could stay in the marriage. So she went back to Vancouver, Canada, where she's from, and spent one night with a friend of hers from college. That his marriage had just gone south. Uh, her marriage, you know, she's married to this crazy French chef who is uh, brilliant but difficult. Um, alcoholic, uh, narcissistic, but also fun and exciting and talented and all those things. And so she goes, the whole South of France shuts down for about like uh, October to say like the Cannes Film Festival, which is like uh, spring. Okay. So she went back to Vancouver and had this, uh, went out for dinner and drinks with a friend of hers from college. One thing led to another, they slept together. And then uh, she was disgusted with herself and ran back to France and reconciled with her husband. But in the in-between time, she had what she thought was her monthly cycle and thought that there was no way that she could be pregnant. So uh, it turns out that she had implantation bleeding. So I had just figured out how to attach myself onto like a blood vessel. So mm -hmm. it looked like it was that. But for 25 years, she thought that I was that man's, that I was uh, her husband's child. And I grew up believing that. And so he was effectively my father. But um, when she found out that she was pregnant after reconciling with her husband, uh, she hoped that the baby would save the marriage. And uh, I didn't because that's not what babies do, you know? And that's, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, at two and a half, she kidnapped me from France and brought me to Vancouver. The French man followed suit and you know, he would drunk dial in the middle of the night, threaten to kill her, kidnap me, take me back to France, kill her whole family. And uh, I would like hear these conversations going on because she would tape record them on the other side of the wall from where I was sleeping. There was part of me that um, was terrified of my father, part of me that hated my father, but then there was also a part of me that just desperately wanted to be loved by my father. So we'd have these court appointed supervised visitations. And during those visitations, um, all he would talk about is how much he hated my mom and how much he, she had like screwed him over and all of those things. But it would be, you know, they're, they'd kind of be put in, in 
a place where it was just difficult for me to process as like a young, young four, three, four, five year old boy. But it would, you know, I'd bring my swimming medals or my soccer trophies or something and like want to like show him something that he could be proud of. And he's like, oh, Morgan, you know, you are this, you are that, but you know, Morgan, you are so much like your mother. You know, I hate your mother. And I'm like, does that mean that you hate me? Or is it just about my mom? But it would just, everything that I did would constantly be turned back to her. And he was constantly trying to like get in there and like, so it was tough. And, um, you know, there was one time as a child that I remember him saying that he was proud of me. And for Christmas, when I was uh, four years old, just prior to my my fifth birthday, he gave me this pianosaurus that was a three octave piano built into the back of a plastic dinosaur. And I was allowed to open one present before my mom woke up. So I opened the biggest box, which was this thing. And it was like the Tickle Me Elmo of that year. It was the kind of it present. And I learned to play, uh, I don't know, six or eight songs before my mom even got out of bed. Mm. And I mean, they were like simple, like Row, Row, Row Your Boat or Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star or something, which I think are actually the same song. And there's, uh, but I was like, I got the hang of it pretty easily and you know color coded keys and little sheet music with the with the numbers and the colors on it and i was so excited to show my dad that i'd learned all of these songs so we took the thing over to his house and um when i showed up with this piano and i played for him him he it was the only time i remember him saying that he was proud of me he's like morgan you are like a uh, like a virtuoso you know you are ah oh, you are brilliant, you know, this is, why are you playing on this garbage? You know, I'm like, well, I don't know, this is the p piano that you gave me for Christmas, but he's like, <laughs> you should have a Steinway, you know, it's just this like whole thing. And this, these grand promises of he's going to buy me uh, a Steinway concert grand and like all of these things. And um, I was just happy that he acknowledged me. And I remember like just that, that feeling, but um as Vancouver does during the winter, it rains up there as much as it's sunny down here. Mm -hmm. So there was uh, like close to frozen rain. We would call it sleet. And uh, when my mom came to pick me up that, that afternoon and she had had to park like, I don't know, two or three blocks away from the house. And so she said, oh, well, you're going to come back here tomorrow. So why don't you leave the Pianosaurus here? And I like fought with her for a couple of minutes of like, no, I want to bring it home. I want to learn more stuff. But she convinced me to leave it there. And that night my dad called drunk and they had a fight and I knew that I wasn't going to see him the next day. And then there was this like three week like thing about like, when are we going to go over there? I want my Pianosaurus. I want my Pianosaurus. And when we finally went over there, it was gone. He had gotten drunk and gave like my most treasured thing away to some random little girl that he didn't even know. And, you know, looking back at that, like I would say that that was probably my deepest wound because there was something in this toy that uh, represented the love of my father. And like, it was the one time that I'd experienced that. And for him to have this, uh, I just remembered how like hurt I was. And there was something that for years, like for years afterwards, probably until I was like eight or nine years old, I, I thought that if I just got a Pianosaurus, that that hurt would go away. Mm. We moved to, uh, to California when I was just shy of being seven. And I went to a garage sale like two years later and there was a Pianosaurus there and I bought it and I brought it home and I played with it for maybe like 10 or 15 minutes. And I realized that it wasn't the Pianosaurus. And it was just this kind of like empty feeling. I don't know if you've ever had that experience of thinking like, oh, if I just get this thing, like whether the thing is an accomplishment or the thing is like a physical thing or the thing is a relationship or the thing is something, if I just get like here, then, you know, life will make sense and it'll be good. I'll feel good, you know, whatever. You know, that really, really stuck with me. And I think, you know, having that experience at that age, there was something that changed in me. And uh, pretty shortly after that, my mom uh, started dating this guy that was 
the guy like I wished my dad was, that he was super engaging, really fun, uh, cared about me winning at soccer and me winning at swimming. And he bought me a little basketball and taught me how to spin it on my finger and like, you know, stuff like that, like dad stuff. And he took me and my mom on a, a trip to Club Med in the Caribbean to this, uh, to the island of Guadeloupe. And we were supposed to be there for two weeks. And halfway th through the trip, um, my mom was off getting, uh, I don't know, doing horseback riding or dance lessons or something. And he and I were learning how to snorkel. And so we were down at the beach and swimming around, looking at all these exotic fish, and then went back to the hotel room afterwards to get ready for dinner. And uh, turns on the shower and then... Uh, invited me to take a shower with him. And I didn't think anything weird about it. But while we were in the shower, uh, he took my hand and put it on his penis and touched me. And uh, I remember thinking how much I didn't want what was happening to be happening. But at the same time, I was frozen with fear. And terrified on so many levels that if I like tried to escape this, that I would be rejected. I wasn't afraid of violence. I wasn't afraid of any of that, but I was, I was really terrified to not get a dad. And, um, I don't know exactly how all long all of this went on, but my mom walked in the room while this was happening and put an immediate stop to it. And, had me throw on um, some clothes kind of haphazardly. I didn't even have shoes on and uh, and took me by the arm down to the security office. And I sat there for what felt like hours. And then she showed up with security and with all of our things and said that we were leaving, that the trip was over and that we were going home. And... Um, I remember just feeling like I had done something wrong, but we didn't have a conversation about it. I mean, like I was a child, I was like five, five and a half years old. Like, I don't know how to have a conversation about that probably at that time. But, mm -hmm. you know, thinking now, like I have, you know, I have a son who's six and a daughter who's eight. And um, though they may be like super excited about watching the new Wonka movie over and over again, or like playing with their Pokemon cards or like doing this stuff. They've got these complex inner worlds. Cause I had a complex inner world at, at his age. And though they may not have the ability to articulate what's going on all the time, I'm just aware of that. I think more as a, a dad, but, um, you know, my mom took me and we flew not straight back to Vancouver. We flew, flew to Florida where his sister lived. And I remember, we pulled up to this woman's house and my mom left me in this rented car and went up, um, rang the doorbell. This woman came down and then my mom and her sat on the front, front porch of this house and talked and cried for like a really long time. And I'm sitting in the car not knowing at all what's going on, but sensing that they're talking something about me and the reason this trip ended. But I just, there was like so much blame that I put on, um, on myself for that. And I think when you have, you know, a, a, a trauma like that, that, you know, I've, I've heard the stories of sexual abuse survivors, um, that suffered very, very, like horrific long-term abuse. And that wasn't, uh, my story in that, in that case. And I think because I'd heard stories of things that I, I classified as so much worse than what I experienced that I kind of dismissed what happened to me in, uh, and kind of compartmentalized it and put it away. And I didn't think about it for years, but that really opened a door for, um, a lot of other, uh, a lot of other things that happened to me as, uh, as a kid. And there was, uh, 
Well, there were just a, like a, a lot of things. Like there, we moved to a neighborhood when we moved to San Diego and uh, became friends with uh, with a family, a uh, boy and a girl. And I'm pretty sure that little girl had been sexually abused because she knew things that no like little seven or eight year old girl should know. And she was kind of a ringleader of other kids that had probably also been abused in the neighborhood. And there were uh, a lot of things that, you know, we did or she instigated with the the other kids in the neighborhood that um, that kind of left a, a, a mark. And there was, you know, moments of pleasure mixed with shame and a lot of confusion and nobody to really talk to about any of that stuff. And again, because like none of it was this horrific uh, experience, you know, in relationship to things that I'd I'd heard about from other people that I kind of felt like I didn't have a... Um, Even at a young age, you heard about these horrific things? Yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't sheltered mm-hmm. as a kid in some ways, like I, you know, and, and no fault to my mom. I adore my mother and um, and know that she made a lot of sacrifices for me and did the very best that she could. You know, I was a latchkey kid at six and a half years old. Like I... I walked home from school to an empty house. And I was also a very bright kid and, um, and read and watched the news. And I went to like movies with her that were written for adults. And we went to the movies all the time. So, you know, my experience starting at a very young age was living in a world filled with adults and doing adult things and having adult conversations. And my mom was studying to be a psychologist. So she's around all of these other psychologists and they're talking about psychology and having, you know, conversations that would be uh, around things that are kind of heavy for kids, Mm -hmm. you would think normally, but I just thought, you know, I, I never like, I never had this worldview that I was a kid. Like I never had like a, they're adults and I'm a child that the way that I relate to them is as a child because I related to them as uh, like just another human being, you know, and I didn't think my age prevented me from having adult conversations with adults, learning adult jokes, like all of that stuff. And I, I think in some ways there's a, an author named John Eldridge that wrote uh, a book called wild at heart. It's a Christian book, very famous. And he wrote another book called Fathered by God and and he talks about the stages of manhood and like it says that for most of human history that manhood has been a series of like um, indoctrinations or inductions to the next stages of of manhood. Like in, in Jewish tradition, you've got a, a bar mitzvah. Yeah. So at 13, you become a man and mm-hmm. you're like – you have to learn all of these things to go through that mitzvah of reciting uh, scripture from the Torah and all of these things. But, you know, the, the idea is at that point you would be treated like a man. Right. But there's a process of preparing and then like a title that's bestowed and, and um, he breaks down the, the stages of manhood of, Uh, like boyhood and a stage that he calls cowboy. And then there's like a bunch of other um, stages. And then you end up getting to uh, eventually this like sage stage. Mm. But there's a a bunch of things that a man will go through on this journey. And uh, I think I just jumped straight from boyhood to adulthood without ever experiencing the natural growth that should have happened in between. So what I didn't realize at the time, didn't realize until much, much later, that a lot of the things that I dismissed had just really shut down the stage that I should have been in. Mm. So in a lot of ways, I functioned like an adult. I would, I didn't think of myself as like less than adult, except I would get frustrated when I was told that I didn't have the same rights as an adult, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But I, you know, I kind of grew up that way and I was, um, 
my mom got remarried to my stepdad who later adopted me when I was, uh, when I was nine and we really butted heads about, uh, leadership where I just refused to be led. And, uh, he is like, he is the best father. He's amazing. And, um, when I, he met my mom when I was eight and stepped into this role of, uh, choosing me. And his dad had been a second born son and, uh, kind of felt scapegoated in his family. His, um, my adopted father's, uh, great uncle who he's named after was shot down in world war II, mm. my grandfather's brother. And my grandfather grew up kind of in the shadow of this larger than life story about his brother who had died. Sure. And though I don't know if his parents ever said it directly, he definitely grew up with the feeling that his parents would have preferred him to have been shot down. Mm. So when my stepdad started dating my mom, uh, his dad had a conversation with him saying, you know, this kid's going to have it kind of tough and you need to be extra in how you uh, really engage with him. So he started, we would have boys night out every Tuesday night where we'd go see a movie, go to dinner, go play mini golf, go bowling, go do something every single week come hell or high water. It was our night. So when he started dating my mom, he started dating me and that continued like well into my teenage years. Um, when they got married, he petitioned to adopt me right away and went through jump through a ton of hoops to make sure that the adoption was final before my baby brother was born. And my baby brother was born a week after I turned 11. My adoption was finalized like three weeks before I turned 11. And to get all of that pushed through in December and early January was like a heavy lift for him. Mm -hmm. But he said he always wanted me to know that I was his number one son, that, that like I never was going to take that would never be taken away from me. And, you know, I think about how intentional he was and how intentional his dad and his mom were with me that I never felt tolerated. I always felt loved, but I had so many barriers to be able to receive that love that even though I could like see it, it was like a, you know, kind of an observer to my own life. I'd skip these, you know, vital stages of, of manhood and then kind of ended up in this this position severely handicapped, but completely unaware of my own, mm. of my own handicaps. And, um, so that was, uh, you know, childhood. And I think that in, um, in a lot of ways, like you, you know, I've always been a, a seeker, like at early, early age, like I would go to church by myself, like four five, six year old years old, early age. I had a friend from daycare that invited me to this Sunday school uh, one week, and then he only went that one week and then never went back. And then I went for like two years. So um, there was part of me that always sensed that there was like a connection to, uh, to something that was beyond mm -hmm. my human senses. I remember praying. Uh, and I uh, remember like a lot of these kind of vivid memories from that part of my, my life. Cause during my parents' divorce, um, after that sexual abuse, like all of those, those things, church was a place where there was peace. But, um, at six, when I was in kindergarten, uh, I was told that Santa wasn't real. And I was like, well, of course Santa's real. There was a first grader that was in my, uh, split kindergarten, first grade class. And one of the first graders was like, now, when you go home tonight, you ask your mom. And I knew if a kid involved an adult, invoked an adult <laughs> yeah. in like a child <laughs> conversation, that they had to be pretty, yeah. pretty darn sure of their position. Uh -huh, so right. uh, that night, I was like weird all afternoon. And my mom sat me down and asked me what was wrong. And it took me a while to get it out. But I finally just blurted out, is Santa real? And... uh she, the best she could come up with 
kind of being put on the spot was that with with that was like, well, we're all kind of Santa's helpers. And I'm like, that's a bunch of, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so uh, what you're trying to say is that the tooth fairy, the Easter bunny and God also are not real. Mm. And I think that she wasn't expecting something that deep. Right. Um, but she was also ill prepared to answer that question. And, you know, it's just another like pivotal moment. God bless her, by the way. <laughs> she, she got you as a son coming with the heavy existential yeah, crisis yeah. questions. She's at, like, at I like thought six. this was going to come at 18 or 35. She's like, Morgan hit him with that six. Yeah. Yeah. A little, <laughs> little ahead of the curve, but that's, um, but there was something, you know, it's like all of the, I was already very disappointed in, um, in the adults that were meant to like care for me and love me, you know? Yeah. And so finding out like, cause I'd kind of like got my theology mixed up, you know, at that age. Cause I think it, uh, as like a young kid, you're kind of filled with this sense of wonder, or at least you should be mm -hmm. if you're in a healthy environment and haven't been encumbered by the worries of the world by that point. And, um, and so I believed um, miraculous things. And as much as there were, um, moments that were difficult, uh, I also had an ex expectation for wondrous things. And at that moment, it, it just kind of like shut down that sense of wonder. Mm. Cause I'm like, you know, the things that I've believed adults for the most have all been lies. Mm. So tell me what form the seeking then took. I think it, I think at that point, you know, probably subconsciously, I just, I kind of made an internal decision of like, if it's going to be, it's up to me and really turned inward. Mm. Um, I remember becoming uh, dishonest. I remember lying. I remember stealing. Um, and I wasn't like, it wasn't like a giant, like F you world. It was just like, I need to learn how to take care of myself. You know, as heavy as that sounds for like a six year old, I wasn't like one of those kids walking around with a dark storm cloud over his head, but, uh, I would find myself in situations where I was in over my head quite a bit and not feeling like I had, uh, a way to stop those things, mm. you know, whether it was the um, sexual abuse with neighborhood kids when we moved to California or uh, when I was 12, like my friends started smoking weed and drinking and all of that. And I just jumped right in there with both feet, but looking for connection. Right. And I look at, you know, things over the course of childhood and, uh, young adulthood, uh, teenage life where post teenager where it was like, I'm, I'm like trying to figure out a way to connect, but it was like, I lost, lost track of where connection really happens. So, you know, I just tried to look in a bunch of ways and, you know, was a, uh, irresponsible drug user. So, you know, I'd find myself uh, in really difficult chemically induced places quite a bit, overdoses and um, and just being like lost. I found myself in dangerous situations. I had guns drawn on me and um, had uh, friends overdose in, in front of me and like a low, lot of a lot of stuff happened during that period of time, you know, and my parents, I uh, like, God bless them. They were new parents again with my little brother and, uh, had just bought a house and are working hard to like make everything work. And I had read enough of their adolescent psychology books while they were going through school. Both of them, uh, <laughs> by the way, that's where they met was, you know, studying psychology. Um, I had read enough of their adolescent psychology books to be, um, dangerous 
to myself and and uh, and others and enough to like throw them off the scent because mm. I could do all of the things that somebody that didn't have a problem would do. Right. So they were really confused as to what was going on. They knew that there was a problem, but they couldn't put their finger on it right. because I was like, uh, really good at being bad. Yeah, and just good at kind of masking symptoms and yeah. all of that for uh, for what they'd expect. And so we went to, uh, I think, about 60 therapists over the course of two years. Um, we rarely lasted more than a session with any of them because I was antagonistic towards the therapists. Mm -hmm. I was a bad patient. I did not want help. It was not my fault. It was the, everybody else's fault. And uh, at that point, like the only way I was seeking was like synthetically, you know, trying to connect to uh, a world that I, I kind of knew was there. But, um, you know, it's kind of wild because I think the psychedelics are like, um, are like hopping a fence into a party that you've actually been invited to. Say more. You know, if you're invited to a party, you go in through the front door and you're greeted by the host and you're in, in, introduced to all of the other guests and you have like a kind of framework for understanding what your experience is going to be like. Mm. But if you jump the fence and go to a party that you weren't invited to, have no idea who the host even is and then get introduced to all of these people who may or may not have the best intentions who are there, the experience that you could have had is very different than the experience that you're actually having. And there's people that could, you know, pretend to be somebody that they're, they're not and you would have no way of knowing because you didn't go there through a legitimate means. You like kind of broke into it. And um, that was... Uh, you know, I think that there's, there's people that will have uh, psychedelic experiences and be like, oh, I saw God, or I had this conversation with God. But the fruit of their life is not like one who has had a conversation with God. They're not like suddenly directed on a path that's leading to life. They're not like having signs, wonders, miracles follow them everywhere. They're not like really connected to people and to life. They're like looking to recreate that experience over and over again. And I, I've seen over time, they typically get more lost than found, mm. you know, and we'll probably get to it later, but I just was like, you know, there's things that I've experienced that are like, oh, this is so like amazing, but I would keep wanting to get back there. But the more I tried to get there, the more lost I became right. in the process. So I want to talk we won't linger too long on, on the being lost. Yeah. But I think it's worth, and, and it's especially like, I think we connected over some of, some of the um, specific elements of our both being lost. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. You know, took the form of just seeking in different ways. You yeah. know, you found yourself on a, was it like a vegan commune and oh my gosh yeah well, all this I'll, I'll 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 sum it up in like a minute but yeah, um just tell, give us the, sure. the rundown of all the things you tried <laughs> yeah yeah well, looking for god <laughs> so i had an encounter an encounter with god legitimately on the floor of a starbucks bathroom when i was 19 years old that um i had uh gone to my first rehab at 16 i had gotten sober for uh, two and a half years. I had a couple of false starts and then like really got some traction and was sober for two and a half years, but I was miserable. And uh, my whole sobriety was about performance. I just have to do all of these things. It wasn't, I didn't find freedom in sobriety. I found um, rule following. And that had nothing to do with being in recovery. It had everything to do with like my own heart. Right. So where I'm trying to position my life where I'm staying away from this bad thing. And that's what I looked at, like all of the addiction was bad and now I'm trying to stay away from it. Mm -hmm. But when you develop an oppositional position towards something that's bad, it's mm -hmm. like a magnet 
to like draw you to it. So I'm trying to stay away, right. but like I would have given ever, anything to like get loaded for a weekend and get away with it. Sure. And not have to like come back to my meetings and stand up and introduce myself as a newcomer again, you know, that, um, but, uh, that'll only keep you going for so long and I'm pretty strong willed. So it kept me going for two and a half years, relapsed, almost died several like near death experiences during that, that time before that encounter at 19. But I had, um, I'd gotten confronted by a woman that cared about me very much. And, uh, I went into this bathroom at Starbucks and I looked in the mirror and for the first time in my life, like I saw myself in the mirror and I saw the reality of my life. Because when I got sober at 16, it was like, I have all of these other reasons why I'm in the position that I'm in. Mm -hmm. But at 19, I didn't have any of those reasons. And I'm like looking at myself square in the face in the mirror and I'm like, my life needs to change uh, like 180 degrees right now. And I have no ability to change my life on my own strength. And I just knew it. I was beat. I had this like moment where I'm like, my best efforts at leading a happy and successful life have failed. And this is not the cumulative result of my worst ideas. This is a cumulative result of my absolute mm. best intentions have gotten me to this place that at 19 years old, despite being smart, despite having opportunity despite all of these things this is where i'm at and i got down on my knees in that starbucks and i prayed to a god that i didn't understand i didn't know his name uh i believed that the universe didn't create itself and i was about as far as i'd gotten and i just said god help me and uh something happened where it just felt like a wave washed over me and i started weeping and i sat in that starbucks bathroom and i wept for like 45 minutes and kind of cleaned myself up put my sunglasses on, let myself out and went down to the beach and spent the rest of the day uh, sitting on the rocks talking to God. And it was the first time since like when I was a little kid that I didn't feel like I was praying to a ceiling. And I think that what had changed that day is that I'd been humbled to a place where like it wasn't about me doing some like ritualistic thing on my own strength. It was like me saying, I can't do this on my own strength. And that started a journey. It started a journey, but I, you know, I had a chip on my shoulder against Christianity because I'd been disappointed as a kid. So uh, I'm like a voracious reader. So I read the Tao Te Ching, like a bunch of different versions of it. Stephen Mitchell's was my favorite and uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedic texts and uh, probably 50 of Thich Nhat Hanh's books. Yeah. Like I read Old Path, White Clouds, which is the life story of the Buddha uh, on a trip through France, which is like the worst place in the world to decide to become a vegan. But uh, he put out this idea that all living things were scared to die and it just was like, oh my God, I need to stop like eating animals or like oppressing them. So mm -hmm. uh, I became a vegan like on a month and a half long trip through France, you know, and then that started my journey towards uh, raw food veganism. And I started a really dedicated yoga practice uh, that same year. I was 21. I started going to two Bikram yoga classes a day, which is... Um, fairly intense for any of you who don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't do the like, uh, like chill, like yogic chanting or like guided breathing. No, you it don't was do anything like, chill. no, I don't do anything chill. <laughs> if I'm doing something, I'm doing it. And I was doing it and I'm like a hundred percent vegan, a hundred percent raw, uh, two Bikram yoga classes a day. And like, I'm six foot three. I got to be uh, like 148, 149 oh pounds. Gosh. I looked like a Tootsie Pop. I've got this giant head and this skinny little body. But I could do, you know, 60, 70 handstand push-ups. I could like Whoa. climb buildings, you know, climb trees, uh, climb ropes without using my feet. You know, like tons of, I was very strong, mm. had a lot of endurance, but was extraordinarily skinny. Uh, I later found out I developed an eating disorder called orthorexia, which is an unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. Mm. 
mm. where it became like a full on neurosis. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, I'm, uh, I work in, in advertising and branding and had done very well in my career in that had been approved for a loan to buy a house, dating a girl that wanted to ride off happily into the sunset and make babies and all of that. And, uh, when I got sober at 19, I had made kind of a subconscious list that when I get the girl, the car, the house, get in shape, get the title, get all of these things, then my sh shoulders will drop and my skin will feel like it fits right and life will make sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd never written it down that down. I'd never like consciously spoken those words out, but it was, yeah, it was the new Pianosaurus. It was a more complex Pianosaurus. It was something that I could do that I was in control of. And uh, at 29 years old, I had gotten all of those things. I got approved for this loan to buy the house that we were living in, beautiful home overlooking the ocean, uh, dating this beautiful girl that, um, and you know, there'd been peaks and valleys in between. There'd been like wild sex addiction and experimentation of all kinds and not like just seeking, 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 not finding. Uh, but I was willing to try anything once or twice, maybe three times. If, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I got to this place where I was like, you know, I'd find myself in bed at night watching this girl sleep, feeling a million miles away from her. Mm. And I had this pleasant recurring dream where my house burnt down and my cars got stolen. And instead of waking up feeling devastated, I wake, woke up feeling free. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that this is not the way I'm supposed to feel about my life. But I had so many commitments. And it would be very complicated to like get rid of all my commitments. Work sent me to New York for uh, for three months to work on a, a project. And while I was there, I had a massive panic attack in the middle of Times Square on the way to the office. I was living in a hotel up at Columbus Circle and my office was in the fashion district. So I walked through Times Square every day on the way to work. And one day on the way to work, uh, I felt this tightness in my chest and I'm like a block away from the Viacom building. And at this point, they still drove cars through Times Square. Mm. And there's uh, like a thousand screaming Ashley Simpson fans in front of <laughs> the MTV building because they're like waiting for Carson Daly's yeah. show. And I'm thinking, this is perfect. My, uh, my life is going to end in the midst of like a bunch of like tweens with like, we love you, Ashley placards. And um, I hopped in a car. I called into work. <laughs> Just the, the, the dread that must have come from knowing you and you're this incredibly deep, nuanced thinker who's- I know, and then it's actually well Simpson, and right? And it's <laughs> like, you realize you're going to die yeah. in, in like the, the afterglow of TRL. Uh, right. I mean, it could, exactly. Because it, you know, if it was like- Perfect a musician that I really deeply admired or something. No, that would have been too, that wouldn't have been painful enough. No. You. So uh, you're right. You're right. So I, uh, I hailed a cab. I jumped in the cab and I asked him to take me to Columbus circle and the cabbie somehow misheard me or maybe I misspoke, but he took me to Chinatown. And so like, I'm looking out the window and I'm reading canal street and I'm like, where the hell have you taken me? And he's like, are you not going to pay your fare? And I'm like, no, no, I'll, I'll pay you. But I said Columbus Circle. And he's like, no, you said Chinatown. And I'm like, did I say Chinatown? I don't even know. But I mean, like, I think Times Square is probably the worst place in the world to have a panic attack. Yeah. But like, I think it might be just the worst place in the world, period. <laughs> <laughs> but Canal Street is a close, is a close second. And um, I got out of the, the car and I walked 70 blocks back to my hotel. Mm. And... While I was walking, I made a decision that I was going to break up with the girl. I was going to quit my job. I was going to return the car that the company had leased for me that I had an option to buy. Uh, I was going to turn down the loan to buy the house. I was going uh, to sell some things and I was going to go uh, be a monk. But I wasn't interested in being a Christian monk because um, Christians were small-minded bigots that believed in fairy tales in my mind. Mm. But... Uh, 
I was kind of torn between going and living with Thich Nhat Hanh and Plum Village yeah. in, uh, in France and going and studying with this guy, Gabriel Cousins, out of the Tree of Life in Arizona. And because I was neurotic about my raw foodism, uh, I thought I would probably have to eat cooked food with Thich Nhat Hanh. So I decided to go out to the Tree <laughs> of Life and I applied for... Uh, their um, vegan live food apprenticeship program and the vegan live food master's program that uh, the Gabriel did out there. I got into both and, um, and I just burnt it down like all of, all of my life, everything that this stuff that I thought would bring mm -hmm. meaning, I got rid of all of it. I, uh, and certainly Rings a, rings a few bells of resonance. <laughs> you know, it's funny I remember, about... Remember pushing that button a few times? Yeah. <laughs> the, the funny thing about like this burn it down thing is what I've found is most of the time it's not actually something that needs to happen. It's like you need you get to a point where it feels like a breaking point. Yeah. But all you really need to do is make a couple of adjustments. Correct. But it's like, oh, well, I can't even see that at this point. So like burn it down and yeah. then burn the ships. Yeah. And it's saying instead of instead of me growing and changing, I'm going to change all my circumstances and throw them out so I can continue to be who I am. Yeah. Well, and then inevitably you end up like I did out at the tree of life. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> 143 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But you know, it was like, it was, it was interesting and wild. Like we had a, like a former Air Force One pilot out there and the uh, head designer for Barbie for Mattel, who was mm -hmm. like uh, an East, uh, Eastern European woman that was like shaped like a box. And she used to live in Malibu and was like carving a Barbie one night and she saw herself in the window of the house and looked at the doll in her hand and like was like, I'm not going to, mm. I can't contribute to this anymore. So she moved out there and we'd have like visiting people going on green juice cleanses, but I actually like lived there. Yeah. And the novelty of being there lasted for like a good four months you know, there'd be this host of like very interesting worldly people that were on a quest. And this was like one stop in their quest. And so, you know, it was a distraction from me for a while. And I had great hope. I had, I had bought um, like a hundred books for this vegan live food master's program. And, uh, was doing all these things. And, but then, uh, Gabriel and his wife Shanti asked me to dinner one night and somebody had Googled me and found out that I had this kind of storied career in branding and advertising. And they had me over for dinner and, um, said, we believe that God called you here to be our marketing director. Mm. And I was like, I don't know. Really? He didn't, <laughs> he didn't tell me, you know? <laughs> and they're like, well, how would you feel about that? And I'm like, you know, I, I came out here to run away from me. You know, I didn't say that, but I was like, I just, I feel like I'm supposed to be a, a raw food chef and like maybe have an organic farm or like, you know, do something. Um, my family was in the re restaurant business and maybe I'm supposed to do that in like a more, like healthy, holistic, united, whatever life-giving way or something. Right. And he's like, well, you're here. And, uh, you know, we can't afford to pay you like a, uh, like a New York salary, but you know, there's a house that you can live in and, uh, we'd pay to have all your stuff moved out here. If you have stuff back in, in San Diego, maybe you could give it a try, you know, we'd cover your tuition for the rest of the master's program. And, you know, you'd be able to use the spa and my health practice and all these other things. And I'm like, God, is that you? <laughs> you know, just yeah. this, this moment. And it felt completely wrong. Like everything in me was like, this isn't, but I just, I was out of my own answers. So I said, okay. And, uh, a couple of weeks later, 
went out to San Diego to storage and uh, to art storage and friends' houses where all my things were. And I brought back like 5,000 record albums and all this art and furniture and computer equipment and nice furniture stuff back there and crammed it all into this little tiny house in the middle of nowhere, Patagonia, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And uh, when all of my stuff got there, that part of me kind of arrived. And then I was like, what the hell am I doing here? Mm. And I had yet another like existential crisis, but I, I had somewhat like bankrupted myself doing that because I paid off six months of a $5,000 a month lease to this house. I paid almost 30 grand in depreciation on the car that I was leasing that I had an option to buy. I left this job and then like went all in on this place. And then all of my stuff got there, but that was like the end of my ideas. And people would come over to my house that were in the community and they would like freak out because it reminded them too much of their former lives. Right. So like nobody wanted to come over. Right. And uh, it was probably like the, in some ways, the lowest point in my life because um, I had tried very hard to make myself perfect. And I was just very aware that none of it was working. You know, I think when you have those moments, though, sometimes people will show up miraculously. And I had um, a friend get a hold of me that was starting uh, like a high-end streetwear brand and they needed branding. And they were like, we don't care where in the country, where in the world you are. We'll pay to have you move back. We have a, a place for you to live and we'll give you a part of the company and we'll give you, you know, I'm like, but it got me out of there and got me back to San Diego. And so like I went and did that. And that was kind of the the journey. It was like at the, I was at the end of myself through an amazing series of events, meant, met a mentor that just challenged me. He challenged my intellectual pride. He challenged my religious prejudice. And, uh, you know, I'm in this process of like seeking a spiritual connection and very clear that like my self-willed journey had kind of ended me up uh, where I'd ended up. And he suggested, you know, pretty novel approach that maybe I just look at the people who had a, a specific spiritual path that were in my life and um, see who was getting the best results. Right. You know, and I'm expecting it's going to be like my Buddhist friends because sure. they are very chill. And not to bash them, but it just seemed like a lot of them were like seeking, but nobody was actually finding. Right, right, right. And um, they had a lot of rituals, but they didn't have a lot of breakthrough. When I was a practicing Buddhist, I, um, you know, you practice serene detachment and uh, and have this like, okay, well, I, I can't get attached to the world. I can't get attached to these worldly ideas and and all of that. And so I'm I'm just going to like let thoughts come and I'm going to release them and let them go. And, but the issue with that is I ended up becoming very detached of like not really feeling connected to people. And I don't know if I was just doing it wrong, but looking back at my life, you know, I think in some ways I'd coded uh, like intimate connection as being unsafe. Yeah. So this idea that like detachment was a pathway to spirituality was at least on a subconscious level appealing to me. Right. Yeah. It makes sense with, with your fathers. Yeah. And so, you know, I became what a psychologist would call love avoidant because I just had coded a uh, connection as being unsafe. I would have like intensity, but I wouldn't have real intimacy. Anyway, I, I had this mentor and he challenged my intellectual pride and my religious prejudice. And um, while I was looking uh, at who had great results in their life, I was surprised that there were um, the ones that had the best results were Christian. Mm. I was shocked, like legit shocked. Um, there was one couple, couple in particular, I... Uh, this gentleman, Jeremy and his wife, and Jeremy was somebody that I had uh, 
like sponsored or mentored in 12 step recovery and and he was a christian and it bothered me that he was christian mm -hmm. when we were working together and so i kept trying to get him to read these secular books about the life of christ thinking that he needed to get his worldview expanded because in my mind i had just labeled christians as small-minded bigots that believed in fairy tales and i wanted him to have a more well-rounded spirituality and i kept trying to give him this book uh the Gospel According to Jesus by Stephen Mitchell. And I thought it was like brilliant and deep and like all of the, the things. And he politely declined it uh, several times. He's like, oh, I committed to reading uh, the AA Big Book and my Bible. And I'm like committed to reading those this year. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, at the end of the year, I'm going to give ones. this book, I'm going <laughs> to give this book back to him. And so I, uh, I'm like, I will wait. <laughs> So on his one year, it's so good. oh my gosh, I mean, like I'm, I like, I can laugh at myself because I'm like it at the time though, I'm thinking that I am being gracious and extraordinarily spiritual and, you know, but I, I, I rewrap this book along with a couple of other books. And on the occasion of his one year sobriety anniversary, he asked me to present him with uh, a token to celebrate that milestone. And then I also gave him these wrapped books and he opened the books and then he said, um, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, sure. And we went outside and he said, look, man, as my sponsor, you're supposed to like, let me find a higher power of my own understanding. And you're supposed to support me in that. I think and I don't expect you to understand this, but my faith in Jesus is like the central fact of my life, my identity, who I am, how I live, everything that I believe, that's like the linchpin that holds it all together. And, and I don't expect you to understand that. Like you don't even have to understand that. But in order for this to work, you have to let me have that. And it's pretty clear that you don't respect me enough to enable me to do this because you keep trying to change my mind. And I, I just, I really hope that we can still be friends, but I don't think that this relationship is going to work. And looking back on it, I would think like, wow, what an incredibly like gracious, deep, but like direct, courageous move that was for him. Mm -hmm. But all I could think at the time was like, this is like the nail in the coffin. He is so lost. Mm. That was that. But like, a, you know, six or seven years later, I'm having this ex existential crisis and he had, I'd continued to keep him in my life because I don't like to lose. And I was like, I'm going to win eventually. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't as deeply oh. manipulative as it sounds, but I like, you know, I just, I designed his wedding invitations and uh, I would invite him and his wife to every party that I threw and I threw yeah. parties all the time. Well, I think it's another, another kind of lose. Yeah. You don't like to. I didn't want to lose the relationship, but yeah. I also, I mean. But you but, lost some, you'd lost some serious love as a little kid, like we talked about. Yeah. And I think you don't like to lose. I also oh. did not want to lose. Like yeah. I wanted to it's win. Yes I wanted. To, I was a yes <laughs> and because I also wanted to win, and I, I was like, I'm willing to play the long game in order to win this argument. But um, <laughs> you're like I am, three years I am so it. positioned in my like my my stance that I am brighter and brighter than this guy is, and I will eventually win. Mm -hmm. And um, but I continued to invite him to parties and. After every single party that I had, I have like, I don't know, 100, 150 people over at least once a month. And every single time somebody would call me, sometimes two or three, and they would say, hey, there was a guy at your party. I was talking to him and his wife. I think his wife might be an Eskimo or something, but he's a carpenter and he was the nicest guy. There was something about him. Mm. 
And they'd want to like learn more, know more about him. When I threw, like I'd throw another party and like, hey, is that guy the carpenter? Is he going to be there? And it was never any of the other guests. And I had like interesting people that would come, but they, people always wanted to know about him. And, you know, years later, I'm like watching his life and there, there were things that I judged him for. And he's become like more successful than me in a lot of ways, more consistent. Wait, so the, the carpenter is the guy you were trying to win the argument with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With him. Yeah, he okay. was a carpenter. I mean, surprise, surprise. But he was, uh, <laughs> he and his wife would, would literally have like miraculous things happen. Mm. Um, he's a, a custom woodworker. He now lives in, in Sulawesi in, um, in Indonesia, but he's a, a woodworker and trained in Japanese joinery and would build these like high-end woodworking things and had a, a studio, but he felt like they were supposed to buy a house. So they end up getting a house that was like, I mean, so far above what they should have been able to afford, but it was like through the city having a listing at an auction that wasn't properly listed. And then somehow they were able to get in and get the house for opening bid or something. They find $50,000 in gold buried on the property and are Stop. able to, I mean, it was just stuff like that. And it was all the time. It made like no sense. And while my relationships are failing, his relationships are. That was probably driving you crazy. It wasn't, it, it honestly wasn't driving me crazy. I was happy for him, mm -hmm. but it was perplexing mm -hmm. to me. I still had him in this category of small-minded. But when I'm challenged by this mentor of mine to look at people that have a specific spiritual practice, where it's not just like, oh, I believe in the universe or I believe in the ocean and it's like whatever, it's like they have a, a specific practice. And this guy and I had had this conversation about um, people being built for community. Mm. And he just asked me this question, like, do you believe that people were created for community? And at this point where I was at spiritually is that I believed that there had to be a creator because I'd seen too much perfection to believe that it could just be a divine accident. And I wasn't down with the string theorists that believed in like the multiverse theory that some unconscious parallel universe had somehow sprouted our universe with no thought, no conscious thought or intention that it just, you know, like for something to be so perfect to come from something else. Mm. And even then it's like, where did this multiverse come from? Even the Big Bang people are like, there was this giant ball of gas. What was there before the ball of gas? You know, like, where did this, this come from? I've never th seen anything just like spontaneously come out of like a void. So I believe that there had to be some creator. And this guy, like a good mentor should, just challenged a lot of my kind of unprocessed ideas, like memorized slogans and like other things that I just collected during my lifetime. And mm. he asked me this question, if I believed people were created for community. And I'm like, yeah, of course, you know, like concerts wouldn't exist and like football games wouldn't exist if we weren't meant to be together. Because the reality, you know, like you go to a concert, it's not about hearing the music as the artist created it to be heard. If you wanted to do that, like go spend a couple of grand on a really nice set of headphones and some lossless music player and go listen to the studio recording that the artist spent months or years working on. Not like dozens of like drunk college girls, like screaming off key in your yeah. ear and like getting hit in the head by like a random flying converse, yeah. you know, all-star or something. Like avoid a paper cut from the Ashley Simpson. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but I mean, you know, the, but like concerts or football games, like if you wanted to see the play-by-play, -play, watch Sports Center. 
but there's something about being in a crowd of people that love the same thing that you do mm. that is so deeply a part of the human experience. And the extension of that question was, if God created us for community, don't you believe that he would have revealed himself to people in a way that they could find community around him mm -hmm. rather than so individually that people couldn't connect? And uh, I was like, sure, I'll give you that. And he's like, okay, well then why don't you go look at the people that are practicing uh, a specific practice that involves a larger body or community and see who's getting the best results. And, you know, I mean, like if you read all of the great religious texts of the world, all of them say that they're the only one true way to God. So either they're all wrong or one of them's right. And I'd already traveled down a lot of those paths and just kind of ended up in the place that I ended up with Ashley Simpson in Times Square. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, I'm willing, I'm willing to seek and I'm willing to like, you know, ask questions without like a, a prejudice and see where that takes me. And, um, it took me to calling, uh, my friend Jeremy, who I had, um, really judged and ask him if he and his wife could take me to church. Mm. And I'm so grateful at the way, uh, he answered because he didn't say, Told you so. No, he didn't do that. <laughs> but he also didn't say like, my church has five services and I'll go to any one with you. He didn't make it like weird. It didn't make yeah. like, oh, we've been praying for you. It, it, yeah, it was yeah, just yeah. like, yeah. So we go to this like Saturday night service. It's at seven o'clock. And then, you know, if you want to meet us down there, uh, we could save you a seat. And uh, some of us usually, you know, go get food afterwards and you're welcome to join us for any or all of that if you'd like and he just left it up to me and I went and I heard uh, this, this pastor preach and he just shared like the, the Christian gospel, uh, which gospel means good news. And he said that, um, you know, really the heart of uh, Christian doctrine is not performance. It's not like trying to make yourself perfect so God will be pleased with you, which is what I had done my whole life. Mm, okay. Keep going on that. I, uh, he said that the good news is that God loves you like a father loves his son. And if you accept that relationship, he'll mature you in his time and through his strength and I'm like, that's literally the only way it could work. Because if it's up to me to make myself perfect, like I've Time's made square. myself <laughs> as like perfect as I could be and it wasn't enough. And if this is like being matured by a loving father on his schedule and by his strength, being matured from glory to glory through the stages of life that in relationship where it's not like, you know, go do this on your own, but I'm going to be detached. It's like, I'm going to be in this with you. Mm. I'm like, I think that that could, could work. And, um, so I'm like, I'm willing to believe that. Like, where do I sign? <laughs> you know, like what a, and, uh, and I got it like in my head at that point. And I started to read the Bible. I started to go to church. I started to do like all of the mechanical things. And I started to change a little bit. And I, I got the relationship idea. Cause you know, I'm like, I had questions like hard questions of like, you know, if, if God loves everybody, why would, you know, he allows some people to go to hell. And, uh, 
the way that was best answered for me was, um, and I've understood this so much more in becoming a father, that uh, I can't think of anybody I love more than my kids. You know, I love my wife like deeply, but it's in a different way than I love my kids. Mm -hmm. um, it's not less or more, it's just different. But, you know, like my kids, like I want absolutely the best for them. And I have them in my house for like my daughter's eight years old. So I've got her for like uh, less than 10 years, you know, where she's, she may stay longer. I don't know. I'd be fine right now if she stayed forever, but like my wife may not feel the same way <laughs> once she turns 18, but who knows, you know, and, and uh, you know, I could love her with every fiber of my being, but, um, you know, if she turns 18 and she comes to me and says, dad, look, I know you tried as hard as you could. And, uh, I, I know you love me very much, but I just, I, I don't feel the same way. And I'm, um, I'm going to leave and I'm going to change my name and I'm going to move far away and I don't want anything to do with you. I, and I don't want you to follow me. Because if you follow me, I'm going to reject you there the same way I'm rejecting you here. Just so please leave me alone. That I, I can't think of anything that could possibly be more hurtful. And I don't think that there would be a day of my life that would go by where I wouldn't be like hoping that she would change her mind and come back home. That there would never be a time that I can imagine that I would harden my heart towards her where I would be like, it's been too long. There's too much water under the bridge. You've caused me too much hurt. You know, I don't think that like knowing myself, I don't think that there would ever be a, a time like that. But there would be a window that would close because we're not eternal here on earth, you know? So eventually I would die and there'd be no ability to restore that relationship. And I, I think about that with like, if God calls people and time is like heaven's open enrollment period, where there's an extension of an invitation from a father who loves his kids of like, there's some things that have separated me from you, but I, I came here at this great personal cost, self-sacrificially to try to restore this relationship. And I want you to know how much I love you. And I want you to know how much I want a relationship with you. If I said, I don't want a relationship with you. If I'm an eternal being and I'm going to spend eternity either with God or without God, that hell isn't punishment for people that don't believe. It's not like a, the Bible says that hell was created for the the devil and his demons. It's not a place that was created for people. That if I'm an eternal being and I have an ability to spend life either with God or without God, and he loves me enough to let me have that choice, because love has to be a choice of free will by conscious people. Mm. That if he gives me the choice and I refuse the choice, like no matter how much he might fight for me at some point, I'm either going to end up with him or without him. And if God is love, if God is truth, if God is light, if God is all of those things that I believe he is, then the absence of all of those qualities would be pretty hellish. Yeah, be hell. Yeah. And, you know, I think people put so much on performance and that just hasn't been my experience. Like the the experience has actually been the opposite of that, where it's like relationship not based on performance. And when the pressure of performance is off, I found that I've actually grown a lot more and a lot healthier than I did when I was trying to perform to mm. get love from people, from God, from whoever. So tell me what was the next step? You you started doing the the going to church. Oh yeah, going to church, doing yeah, all that then stuff. Then what happened? You know, it was uh, that was two thousand five. To that, like end of 2004 into 2005. And um, I honestly thought like that was as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. And 
it was good. Like I felt, yeah, it was good. I felt connected. I felt like my prayers were going somewhere. I started growing, changing, um, in ways that I hadn't been able to mm-hmm. before my involvement in, uh, in 12 step recovery took on like a much deeper and more meaningful, uh, uh, place than it ever had before because instead of like kind of giving lip service to believing that there was a power greater than myself in my life, I'm actually experiencing what the results of that are. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, you know, if you know anything about that, that fellowship, like the 12 steps, there's the first three steps that are kind of like, um, foundational, you know, I believe that I've failed you know, at whatever way, like I've, uh, lost power over alcohol, over drugs, over, uh, relationships, whatever it is. And then my life's become unmanageable. And I'm, if I can't do it on my own, I believe that there has to be some power beyond me that's going to restore this. So I'm going to make a decision to turn my will, my, uh, thinking and my life, my living over to the care and direction of God. So the rest of the steps are supposed to be propelled by that decision. But if I don't have like real power in my life, then everything is going to be performance. So I go into step four of like making a searching and fearless moral inventory of my life. If I don't have God at this point, I'm going to be looking forward to step five, which is sharing that inventory with another human being. But the fifth step in in AA or whatever 12-step fellowship that you have to be involved with is we admitted to ourselves or we admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. That's step five, that God's first, myself is second. And the other person is just supposed to be there as a witness to what's happening between me and God. But if I don't really have a connection with God, my entire writing of my inventory and all of the pressure is going to be on the conversation that I'm having with the person. Okay. You know, and so step six and seven, which is uh, preparing to ask God to remove my shortcomings and then uh, asking him to, to take those, it's going to again turn into performance where I'm trying to like overcome the bad behavior that I just... I admitted it to this person mm. in my fifth step that I like looked at in the fourth step. And then steps eight and nine, which is uh, preparing to make amends and then going out and making amends to people are going to be about how well my amends are taken and not as a follow through on the commitment that I made in the third step that if God takes away my difficulties, that I'm going to let my life be a witness to him. Okay. So I... You know, I don't know how familiar you are with this process, but there, there was I read the big book last okay. year. So yeah, you get the book. Yeah, great book, great book. For, so by the way, for, for anyone, like everybody, for every life. life. Yeah. But if the pressure is put on the person to perform, and this was like literally my entire twelve step experience before coming to Christ, that I thought amends were going and saying, "I'm sorry." I didn't see that going and making amends was committing, was like the fulfillment of the commitment that I made in step three, that there's a a prayer in step three uh, that says, um, effectively, like, God, if you take away my difficulties, I'm going to let victory over them bear witness to those that I would help of your power, your love, and your way of life. And the best and most fruitful opportunity that I have in that is to go back to the people that I harmed. Because the other ones that just know me, like in this cleaned up, relatively healthy state, I can tell them all about my past and they can be like, oh, wow, that's really great. But the ones that I actually, the ones that actually like experience the fallout Mm -hmm. from how I used to live, Mm -hmm going to them and not just saying, I'm sorry, but saying like, Hey, I'm going through this process of, um, of really like restoration and recovering my life. And I realized that like, I've made a lot of mistakes and I've harmed a lot of people. And part of this, uh, part of this process is going back to the people that I've harmed and 
not just admitting my mistakes, but like being willing to do my best to set those things right. And I realized I harmed you and I would love to, if you would give me the opportunity to sit down with you and talk to you about that and see what I can do uh, to right these wrongs. And approached in that way, most people will say yes. But, uh, and if they don't, you know you've done everything you could and you just pray for an opportunity to do it better later. Mm-hmm. But um, when I went to to those people, you know, I went through through the 12 steps in uh, when I first got sober and then practiced that, but it was like performance. And when I started working with that mentor uh, at about 10 years sober, when I had that existential crisis, we went back through uh, the 12 steps, but with God at the center of it. Mm. And when I got to step nine, the amends that I went out and made, um, I had a list of all of the harm that I'd caused. And I had about 150 people or thereabouts on that list. And I had little, uh, four by six cards with like bulleted, uh, ways that I had, uh, shown up in a less than excellent way in our relationships and really caused some harm. And the conversations were very different. They were like, you know, I, I didn't pull any punches about what I was doing, but I also didn't like go out there and say that I went religious, you know, it was just like, here, I'm, I'm here to, to do my best to clean this up. And, um, you know, these are the things that I'm aware of uh, specific ways that I harmed you. Are there any others that I'm not aware of that you'd like to tell me about? And listen, and then would you like to tell me about how any of these things affected you and listen? And sometimes like I, if I'd really hurt the person, they'd eventually like talk in a circle Mm. and they'd find themselves starting to repeat things that they'd said at the beginning of the conversation. Mm. And I would know, and they would know that they got out all of the things that they had rehearsed to like say to me if they ever got the opportunity. And in doing that, um, not only did I really start to get free, but so did the other people. And, um, you know, I, I, it took me about two and a half years to go through that, that process, but I finished my last amends from that list. And, you know, I created way more wreckage in sobriety than I did, uh, before I got sober the first time, but, you know, going to somebody at like 10 years sober and saying like, Hey, I was, fully conscious and aware of what I was doing, but nevertheless, I did this to you Mm. is like, doesn't, it's not as nice as like, oh my gosh, I was like a hope to die drug addict. And like, I made all these mistakes. I'm so sorry. And they're Mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, well, I'm so glad you're doing so well. It's like, I was totally sober and I did this anyway. You know, like, (laughs) (laughs) I, and I thought that that's what it was going to be like, but it wasn't, you know, when I, I realized that sobriety had very little to do, uh, with like the, I mean, it, it was definitely a foundation that life could be built on, but it didn't stop life from happening. And, um, there was one amends that I wasn't able to make. I uh, I did my very best, but the girl was like, I don't have any interest in like, talking to you about anything that happened before, during, or after our relationship at all. Uh, do I make myself clear? And I was like, yep, crystal clear. And, uh, and I just had to let it go. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, truth be told, there wasn't anything like really that bad, but she just wanted to hold on to it. And I was like, Hey, if that changes, you know, let me know. She's like, it won't. Okay. (laughs) Bye. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I got to the end of that that list. And I realized, you know, when I finished that last appointment that there wasn't a single person, uh, on earth that I owed anything to. And there's like a really unique freedom that comes from that, that is, um, almost indescribable. But, uh, you know, I was, I was, that was new year's, uh, New Year's, early New Year's morning, 2007, that I had that last conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've tried to keep things pretty clean since then. But, um, 
Easter of 2010, I had like a straight up encounter with God at a church service and it wasn't had anything to do with the church service. The church was like big, like mega church, non-denominational, seeker friendly yeah. Easter service where there was nothing surprising about it. I didn't think the worship was particularly good that Sunday. I like, I was kind of checking my Easter box for going to church, sure. but, um, after the service, uh, after the preaching was over, there were a bunch of people that raised their hands and said that they wanted to be a Christian and went off in some back part of the church to go get prayed for and get a free Bible or something. And I'd already gone through that process. So I felt like I was good, but they invited a guy up to give a communion message and, um, It didn't have anything to do with the communion message. It didn't have anything to do with the message uh, of the service. But um, there were suddenly thoughts in my mind that were not there before that were completely different than any other thoughts that I had ever thought. And later on, when I read the book of Job, uh, the last love the, book the last three chapters of the book of Job, uh, God in the whirlwind is like, a total smart ass for anybody that's listening. That's unfamiliar with it. It's basically like Job has had a fairly difficult period in life and he's had some people that are speaking into his life that aren't all that wise. And, uh, this world really difficult <laughs> <it's> mildly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's pretty bad, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it starts off like Job 36 or 37 or something. And like, God's like, who darkens my doorway with this like lack of wisdom? It's like, oh, well, clearly, you know, if you're so wise, like, tell me what it was like when I separated the, like the heavens from the earth, when I told the tide that it could come this far and then it couldn't come any further. Well, obviously, you know, because mm -hmm. you were there, right? You were, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, of <laughs> course. And this like banter goes on for like three whole chapters. Mm -hmm. And I know that God's got to have like an incredible sense of humor because if you read it, it's very funny. It's funny. And also what's I think very unique and special about the book of Job, when we talk about some of the, you know, other spiritual texts that you mentioned yeah. earlier is that it builds in doubt. There, there's sure. this character, if we can call him a character, mm -hmm. Job, who, who doubts yeah. the very thing that this book is here to uh, elicit. Sure. And that's pretty, I think, unique to have, have like a counter argument built in. Yeah. To, Especially considering that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. It, um, it predates all of the other biblical texts by like several hundred years. Yeah. And, uh, I had never read it at that time that as much as I had been this voracious reader of spiritual books, I had read a lot of books about the Bible. I had read several books about Jesus, but I had never actually read the Bible. So interesting. It is so funny. And it's like, but I had deeply held opinions yeah. about something yeah. that I had never even explored. Yeah. Well, we could go way off on that, but take me back to the moment in the Okay. Church. So I'm, I'm in this church service and and maybe we'll do a part two. Well, okay. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> so I'll tell you that like I'm in this church service, there's a communion message going on, but there's this conversation that's going on uh, between my ears that is different than any other conversation that I'd have. And um, very much like the book of Job where, you know, when I was a little kid, I was fascinated with dinosaurs and my stepdad adopted father would take me to the Denver, Denver Natural History Museum where they have like a bunch of dinosaur bones. And I think he had a friend from high school or something that worked there and you can see the bones that weren't just like the plaster casts that they mm -hmm. had on display. And I was like fascinated. But um, so this, this boy, and I loved Carl Sagan. You know, I would listen to Carl Sagan and there was like some... Love like Carl Sagan. Oh my gosh. There's this like this electronic group called the Symphony of Science that had like remixed Carl Sagan. <laughs> There's a song like a new more glorious. They're not nerds at all. No, not at all. <laughs> but uh there's a song called A New More Glorious Dawn. And I'm just like 
it was like a YouTube video in like early YouTube, like 2002 days. Mm -hmm. And it was like epic. But um, this voice that I'll call God, because I know it wasn't just me thinking, because I'd never thought this way before, says like, so you love Carl Sagan. And I'm like, well, I really like Carl Sagan. Sure. And and you believe, you know, what he and the other astronomers say that that in the known universe that there are just in your little galaxy that there are between 350 and 500 billion stars that if you were to count those stars just in the milky way at the rate of 1 per second that it would take you 3 or 4000 years to count them all. And you've never doubted that in the known universe, there's more galaxies than there are stars in your little tiny galaxy. Mm. And many of them, five, 10 times the size of your galaxy. And that astronomers say that there's more stars or more galaxies in the known universe than there are stars in yours. And that if humankind started counting stars at the dawn of humankind and all humans did was count stars, that they would have barely scratched the surface. And somehow you think I'm big enough to create all of that, but doubt my ability to knock up a virgin or raise a dead guy. And I'm like, okay, sure. Like the virgin birth and resurrection, I've, I'd, 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 for years I'd been like, if God exists outside of time and knew the end from the beginning, why would he ever have to like rely on flashy miracles? You know, can't you just believe that he like created everything and just kind of acts anonymously? And that had been a big argument of mine for a long time. And then like, I'm kind of set with this, like, okay, well, so what? Well, when you were a kid, you used to love dinosaurs. I'm like, yeah, you used to get your dad to take you to the Denver Natural History Museum and look at all of the dinosaur bones. And you probably know how many fully intact dinosaur skeletons archaeologists have found. And I'm like, yeah, actually, strangely enough, strange little Jeopardy factoid around <laughs> 10,000. Do you think it's at all strange that over the course of archaeology that they would have found 10,000 fully intact dinosaur skeletons that are supposedly hundreds of millions of years old, but have so far failed to find anything close to a complete skeleton that would link man to ape? I'm like, yeah, actually, that's super weird. I had never thought about that before. I was watching something on Discovery a, a few weeks ago, and they'd found like a fragment of a skull that was like two inches by an inch, and they'd like it was just calcified carbon. There wasn't any DNA left in it, and they'd like recreated this whole like monster of a person based on on that as some sort of missing link. But they've never conclusively found it. And I'm like, yeah, that, I think that's super weird. And then there was a this question of like. All right, little man, do you think it's possible that you don't know everything? And I'm like, yeah, I think it's pretty probable that I don't know much. And um, right at that point, uh, the entire rest of the church was like invited to take communion. And I took communion. And as I ate this little like wafer and drank, this grape juice, um, it was like he supernaturally downloaded uh, Christ's sacrifice in a way that like completely changed my life. That um, I had walked out of the passion of the Christ. I just, I, I told my friend who took me, I'm like, I, this is way too brutal. Like, I don't want to see how he died. If they made a movie about how he lived, I'd, I'd go see that, but I don't want to watch this. This is like, like, gore porn it's like unnecessary mm -hmm. and gruesome and it's like guilt baiting i'm i was like so offended by it but then i like i saw it in this way that was like eye opening and it was n it had nothing to do with any of the things that were going on yeah i understand around me and i'm just weeping and the guy that um that i went to church with he was like a guy that i i sponsored mentored in aa and he was like bro you all right and i'm like i need to be discipled and i need to be baptized and he's like 
okay, well, they have baptisms like once a quarter or something. You can go like sign up. I, I think there's like, and I'm like, I had like trying to explain it to him. And it was just like, I was in a moment. So it was a moment that like really changed my life. And like very soon after that, um, I got baptized and that was a interestingly supernatural experience. I had a chiropractor that made it very awkward and demanded to find out like how, what had happened to me over the weekend. He would just make usually small talk of like, oh, what would you do last weekend? But that weekend it was like, what happened to you? And I didn't want to tell him. He was a Scientologist. I didn't want to get into it with him. I thought it was weird. But after like over a week of demanding what happened to me the previous weekend, uh, I told him that I'd gotten baptized. And he said, and I asked him why he was so insistent about asking me. And he said, because uh, he didn't recognize my body, that he'd been adjusting me for a year. And if he was honest with me during that year, he kind of thought I was a dick. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> since this, like this event that he didn't know what the event was that I, he first of all, didn't recognize my physiology. And uh, from kind of judging me as somebody that he didn't like, um, not just him, but all the girls in his office were like looking forward to me coming in and they didn't understand why. Mm. And uh, it was like the week after I got baptized and it was, um, he told me that and it was like, I knew that something had changed, but for somebody that I didn't really even know or care for to, um, to acknowledge that was like, pretty special um you were starting to glow like jeremy yeah yeah and just to like there's something about him and so that you know that started it and uh i went to a um a christian missionary equipping discipleship school that i was able to go to because i work for myself and i was able to like arrange the time to be able to go do that in like a full-time capacity and it was mm -hmm. weird because I had never been around uh, Christians, especially like um, sold out Bible believing evangelical Christians. They, um, I had a lot of judgment. Uh, I, I didn't even know any Republicans. Not that the two have to be related, but it's just there's like an association that I think people make. Uh, and I thought people, I, I thought nobody had voted for George W. Bush, that he only won, uh, the election because it was rigged. I thought people that had W stickers on their car were like people with hipster mustaches that nobody actually voted for him. That was like a joke. Mm. And, um, I had not been around, uh, I, the idea of being like a virgin until marriage, like I, I thought the only reason that people were virgins was because they were deformed, uh, ugly or socially awkward. And then it was like a convenient excuse to not be sexually active. They're like, oh, I'm saving myself. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, um, but there were a bunch of people that were in the school that, uh, some of them were politically conservative. Uh, several of them were virgins and they were really wonderful people. And, uh, you know, I think that there are some people that are very intelligent that are fools and there are people that lack natural intelligence but are incredibly wise. And I was starting to get uh, my pride handed to me in a lot of unexpected ways of just having a ton of prejudgment towards these people that I'm suddenly surrounded by and learning from. And uh, where I thought I'd been brilliant and capable and all of this, these people had lived completely different lives than mine that had been markably more successful mm. uh, in finding a path to peace and meaning and all of that. And, uh, you know, that really kicked it off. That was 2010. And um, through that school, I met a girl that introduced me to the woman who's now my wife. And uh, we dated and 
got married and we didn't sleep together before we got married, which was a very odd experience to me, but it was like wonderful where I didn't have the crutch of uh, physical intimacy that I could really focus on the emotional intimacy and, um, and really focus on getting to know her uh, outside of being like physically dependent on, on her in any way. And uh, we've got two beautiful kids and our pastors at a church and we lead a recovery ministry there that um, was what I needed when I was 10 years sober that I think sometimes in like, God bless, uh, God bless AA and God bless the other secular recovery programs. Um, they save my life. But uh, sometimes there can be such a focus on like singleness of purpose of like, we're not going to talk about outside issues in this fellowship, but at uh, almost 10 years sober, I had only succeeded in being physically sober. Right. You know, I'm like running off the rails with codependency, orthorexia, workaholism, compulsive spending, uh, sex addiction, porn addiction, like all of this stuff, like where I'm like playing this perpetual game of whack-a-mole with dysfunctional behaviors and getting one under control to only have two more pop up over here. Mm. And, uh, you know, we thought when we were putting this group together that um, maybe if we didn't limit it to people that were dealing with one dysfunction or another, but had everybody in the same room um, and just kind of prefaced it that like whatever your area of dysfunction in is kind of your golden ticket into uh, being able to like seek um, God in a more profound way as if your life actually <laughs> depends on it because it does and um, and see the, what the results are. And over the past five years that we've been doing that, we've had uh, 1,500 people go through um, this 12-step workshop that we do and uh, have seen literally dozens of restored marriages, like completely changed lives and people going from like being extraordinarily dysfunctional, like I was mm -hmm. to not. And, um, that's been neat, but that's the, the sort of long version of, uh, of all of that with all the twists and turns that you asked me to tell you about my well, there's, childhood. There's, yeah. Well, there's so much in there that I think I know one I'm taking away from your story and and others. I have a few questions um, personally. Sure. Um, I feel really connected when I go to church. Mm -hmm. um, I never went to church until we went to Emerge, yeah. where we where we met, and um, in environments like that where people are worshiping together. Um, people are praying together. I mean, it's very, God's presence is very palpable mm -hmm. for me. It's not a subtle thing. And that came as a surprise to me. Um, me too. Because I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm Jewish, sure. right? Yeah. I'm Jewish. So I, I went to, what would you call it? Is it a men's retreat? Yeah. Yeah. yeah men's, men's retreat. retreat. Um, and it was just really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and I've since uh, started going to church, you know, in my, in my daily life um, and not my daily, my weekly life. Sure. <laughs> and, and the same thing happens every week, you know, yeah. in the, in, especially in the worship, you know, music. God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I always get stopped up or jammed up. I don't know what you call it. Um, with the exclusivity. Okay. Which is say, you know, like this is the way and it's the only way as you, mm -hmm. as, as you mentioned earlier. And it's like, I love everything about this except that thing. Sure. And when I, when you mentioned your, in, in your path, you said, Hey, well, all these traditions say, they're the only one. So they're either all wrong or one of them's right. Yeah. But do you think it's possible that some of them may be right for other people? Well, I don't know. So that's really two, you know, two questions. Sure, what sure. do you do with so that? So I would look at, I, I'm practical. So I always look at, at 
um, you know, like my mentor did to me of like, look at the, look at the results mm. that, you know, you're very disciplined about like fitness and health because you see results from that. And if somebody came and tried to argue why their like flaming hot Cheeto habit was somehow healthy, you'd probably have an opinion about it, you know, right? <laughs> right. But they may have like, you know, just an absolute love affair with it and believe things. I've had conversations with people that have had some very bizarre beliefs around healthy eating. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, and some of them, I can like look at them and just be like straight up, you are unhealthy. Yeah. You look horrible. horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to not listen to your advice. Yeah. So like, he, for me, I guess not to interrupt, yeah. I'm going to interrupt. Yeah. The answer doesn't seem so clear. Well, I'm not saying that everybody that's not a Christian is like a flaming hot Cheeto fan. Yeah, I get that. Um, but I know I'm, you're not. But you know, I'm, I'm giving kind of an extreme example in, you know, I think in tr in order for truth to be true, it has to be true that there has to be like a universality to, to truth. Cause there, there's like an idea of like, well, this is my truth. That's your truth. And sure. there's some things and I just don't like, I prefer not to use that word in as universal uh, a way, because there's some things that are, um, which word just saying that this is like my, my truth or like, yeah, yeah. Okay. you know, cause in some ways, at least in my mind, it can be like a dividing point where there's things that I know to be true because I've experienced them. Yeah. And, and so I guess you could say that's my truth, but I could just say it's my experience, Sure, you know, and, and where I see like a lot of, um, issues is, is when people get hung up on ideology rather than looking at experience mm. that, um, you know, I've spoken at a, like a lot of 12 step conferences and, and stuff. And, uh, and I've never been given grief for talking about my faith in Christ, Yeah. but I've also never said you must. I've always said, this is what happened. This is what I was like. This is what happened. And this is what I'm like now, now, and this is what happened in be in between. And it's like, you know, you can do whatever you want with that information, true. but it doesn't change the fact that I experienced it. Yeah. And so, you know, I've talked to many people that have grown up in a variety of faith backgrounds. Um, what I've found fairly universally is when they actually hear what, Christi what Christians believe, they're like, oh my gosh, that's really life-giving. Yeah. Um, and you know, some, some are very attached to, uh, to various spiritual paths, uh, because of family relationships, because of a number, number of things. And I've been to different parts of the world where there's like, uh, various types of worship that goes on. I've spent a lot of time in Indonesia, uh, doing work over there. And there are a lot of very religious Muslims and a lot of very religious Christians that uh, have a practice. But m my experience with the conversation is when they ask me about my faith, what they're doing, they, f they sort of like come to a point where they realize that what they're doing is wanting for them. And they're like, wow, what you believe is, you mean I, I don't have to do all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So they, they see in you someone who's found and they feel like seek, they're seeking. Yeah, and I mean, like, you know, th there's a promise in, in the Bible that like God will complete every good work that he starts in you until the day of Christ's return, which basically means that you're never really going to arrive, that you're going to be in a perpetual state of being perfected. Okay. So, you know, I don't, claim to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but the, you know, I also know that what I've experienced is true. And 
I could talk theoretically about what I believe. With the best of them. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I just, I try to stay out of it because it's, yeah, it's I, like. I, I hear you. You know, and my mom is, is more of like a, a, like universalist where it's like, why don't all, all paths lead to, mm. to Rome? And, um, and I'm like, you know, that's like, if I eat a bag of like refined sugar, why can't my insulin levels just stay normal? Mm. You know, it's like, well, it's not the way it works, you know? So there's a, and I just, I don't believe that like God created people for damnation. You know, the Bible says that he wants all to be saved, you know, for however that word translates. And so, you know, I, and I also believe that everybody will be given an opportunity. Mm. So I try not to get into arguing about whether theoretically this giant group of people that appear to be doing fine would be better if they were believing something completely different or living totally different lives than they sure. live. Cause like the truth is, you know, there's a lot of variables and based on my experience, I have a sneaking suspicion that you look at non-Christian cultures and the value of human life in those cultures and not to say like doctrinally, but just practically, hmm. um, going to, and I've traveled extensively around the world and there, there are some places that appear to be like really nice, like really nice, cheery people. But when you look at, um, human trafficking and murder rates and like all of these other things in the culture, it would, or, and oppression and people taking advantage of people and like all of those things, it's a little, it tells a little bit bigger story. And I, I try not to get in, into all of that. I look more at like, you know, my life personally and like who's in my sphere of influence. And if they're seeing something of like, hey, that guy seems to be living differently, seems to be getting better results, I'm going to ask him. Yeah. You know, or if there's an opportunity to have a conversation, then maybe I'll like tell them, but I'm, I, I never go about it of like, this is what you have to believe. It's more of just asking questions of like, you know, how's it working for you? Because mm -hmm. that's what really changed me. And looking at, you know, I, I, I look at like women's rights in Muslim cultures. And from my like male Western perspective, a lot of those women look pretty oppressed. Mm -hmm. But it could be that they're just extraordinarily modest and really truly in their hearts want their beauty and everything that they are, the way they express themselves as a woman to be reserved for their husbands. And that's deeply their choice and they don't feel like the least bit badgered or like forced into compliance or whatever. I don't know that to be true because yeah. I don't know them. I just have a suspicion that that's probably not the case. So what I'm hearing is the question isn't, isn't so important. What, what's more important to you is to share, not your truth, the truth of your life. Yeah. Of the truth experience. of my, the truth of my experience. And because that can be a gift to others. And, you know, one theme that's sort of emerged is, I would say is emerging with some of the guests I've had. Yeah. Uh, I had a wonderful, um, the last guest was named Chris Wark, and he wrote the book, Chris Beat Cancer. And, you know, he in no uncertain, he talks about how he changed his diet and yeah. his life, but he in no uncertain terms talks about how his faith in Jesus was a part of him curing himself. Um, but his life now is about, 
sharing what he did and yeah. said, like, Hey, you don't have to, you know, get this toxic, horrible radiation. Like there's another choice. And, sure. and I did it. And he interviews people who did it. And all, he says, all cancers, all stages, like we see. So the theme that's emerging is that after the transformation, the breakthrough, the way to alive in that and radiate that and have it, you know, take over all parts of your life is to share it. Yeah. And so that's what I see in your life. I, I know that's part of why you're here today. I like to think, you know, you want to hang hey, with you. Well, I do so. too. Because. <laughs> but um, that when you talk about your life now, it's not... It's not, hey, I got baptized and now I'm really happy, I swear. Yeah. It's, I started the fellowship mm -hmm. that I saw I could maybe help people in a way that I would have liked to be helped 10 years before and yeah. 1,500 people and changed lives and changed marriage. It's, it's not about you. It's bigger yeah. than you. And that's really beautiful. And the last thing I'll just flag, you know, there's so many things we could talk about. Um, it's just this, you know, you got a big old brain in there mm -hmm. and, um, I'd like to think I have one half as big you know, as yours. <laughs> um, but I think what's very poignant about your life story, why I resonate and why I know others listening to this will resonate is So many of us are turned off by traditional religion for whatever reason sure. um, in the culture today. You know, you talked about, for you, it started with Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it occurs to many, I think, you know, like millions of people as like this archaic old thing sure. that doesn't apply anymore. And I think you would e even agree probably like some places where it's practiced, that's true. Mm -hmm. And so what, what we have is like, you know, this generation of people my age and a little older, a little younger, who are trying to create this life, mm -hmm. this, and, and create an artifice to, to plug up the God sized hole they have in their sure. life with the gym or the, the diet and um, other sub communities that we can get into. And as you know, this is a new thing for me, like looking around and you can imagine some of like the communities I might end up in, course, which yeah. are like really cool, but there's like something a little off, yeah. you know, or like, wow, these people are really successful, but like, Dang, a lot of them are getting divorced, you know, sure, like, sure. a lot of them seem like they're about to get divorced, you know? Yeah. And so just going, okay, like as skeptical as I always have been of religion yeah. and my own, in my own lineage was Judaism. Gosh, I think like after, you know, all this running around seeking, trying to, trying to build my own religion mm -hmm. and, and meeting other people that are doing the same, I think I'm more skeptical of people trying to create their own sure. religion, like figure it out all yeah. on, out on their own. And there does seem to be this like ineffable peace and could call it a glow in those that have realized that they can't do it all on their own. And there's a, there's a, higher power working in their life. And um, that has caused me to be really curious um, about my own tradition. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, like there was a great interview I heard and I, I hope to have um, this wonderful rabbi and rabbi, rabbi Wolpe, David Wolpe mm -hmm. on and they're talking about Judaism. And like, I because I'm Jewish, I grew up, around a lot of Jewish people. Sure, yeah. I grew up around a lot. I mean, like I was like honorarily yeah. Jewish. I grew up in La Jolla, like so, you know, Shabbat dinners, yeah. Passovers, Hanukkah candle lighting, Rosh Hashanah, 
<laughs> reading Baal Shem Tov stories, like, I mean, I've like got, like, I'm like more Jewish than a lot of Jews are. Yeah, and I got it. Um, and there's beautiful, like, there's beautiful things that I think some Christians don't understand about Judaism. There's a, be- there's a lot of like beauty in. Oh, they're super similar. A in Jewish. A lot over that. Oh my, well, I'm, Jesus was Jewish. Like, there's not like a, yeah. there's not a way of getting around that. And, you know, the feasts and, um, there are more like calls to celebration and feasting and worship in the Bible than there are like anything else. You know, Jesus ministry grew around uh, a table and there's like a warmth of breaking bread. And, you know, you look at the, um, that he started his ministry, uh, at a celebration, he ended his ministry at a celebration. Like his ministry started at a, a wedding feast. It ended at a Passover Seder, you know, like there's, um, you, you can't remove the Jewishness of Jesus, but there's some things, you know, you'll read like old Testament things. And in my opinion, um, you know, I study, like, I'm fascinated by Hebrew. I'm fascinated by the Hebrew gematria. Like every Hebrew letter has a, a number associated with it. The numerical value of the letters in a word add up to the numerical value of the word. There's depth of meaning that if you don't get some of those things, even like Hebrew, the Hebrew letter forms are pictographs. Mm-hmm. And understanding like the pictographs and how like when the pictographs come together, that they kind of tell a deeper story than just what the word is. Um, I wish more Christians would get more excited about learning, um, learning about Jewish tradition. I've spent time in Israel. I like, I mean, there's, yeah. I could live in either Israel or Japan. I, uh, but I would probably prefer Israel because like, I just love the culture yeah. so much, but I only, I only say that to say that there's, um, there's some real beauty in understanding, uh, you know, understanding that, that tradition, but then also looking at religion, you know, and, and the only people that Jesus really had trouble with in the Bible were very religious people. And he was constantly right. yeah, like, that's super true. You know, yeah. <laughs> he didn't go around like the, the people that were, like very sinful, he healed them and transformed their lives. Like that was like his, his ministry. But people got mad when they, he did that on the wrong day. And to and this man, day. You can't do a miracle on, on a Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the, so you, you, you go to uh, like parts of Chel- Tel Aviv that there's a, a neighborhood where they will literally like stone you if you drive on the Sabbath, but you know, I don't know if you've been to Israel, but like the, you know, you, you go into hotels and on Friday afternoon through uh, Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, the elevators stop at every floor to prevent people from pressing the button. Right, 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 right. You know, there, you can't light a match. You can't turn on yeah, a light and switch. And you have these like stories of very devout Jews that like will get someone else to push the button for them or something. And it's just silly. It's just you know? so, it's, it's so, so like stupid, yeah, but that's it's no spirit, just yeah. following rules. But then you take like, you know, old Testament rules, like you can't, uh, boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. And, uh, I can know, follow like, that one. Who on earth <laughs> would do, but I, you know, I, like I asked a rabbi about that of like, why you don't mix meat and dairy. And he's like, oh, it's really simple because dairy brings life and meat is death. We just prepare them separately. So you don't mix life and death. Mm, and I'm beautiful. like, oh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's beautiful, but it's like, if somebody's not vegan and they happen to use the same like frying pan and put butter in it yeah. because they want butter with their eggs or something, you're going to be okay. You know, mm-hmm. it's, uh, Believing that somehow they're going to lose favor with God because of like some stupid oversight 
Like Jesus said that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So people no longer had to be under it in order right. to, right. Uh, to be able to attain communion with God, it to be considered righteous. You know, he goes after the rabbis and says that it's not like what you put into your body. Like you can go and be like the most like kosher of the kosher. Mm. You can do all of the things, wear all of the right clothes, but it's not what you put into your body. It's what comes out of your body that's that, that defiles right. you. And then like, you know, the people that throw stones at cars on Shabbat, it's like, it takes effort to pick up a rock. Yeah. You're working. You're working. <laughs> and it's just dumb. And that's, that's where. There's probably examples of that in every oh, tradition. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's where, but from, from specifically, you know, like there's, there's people that uh, call themselves Christians, but they don't have uh, a life-giving practice mm. where like nobody's asking what's different about them. They're asking like, what's wrong with them? Right. You know, there's <laughs> like. <laughs> exactly. So it's, I mean, one last thing. I want to talk to you about your, you're in that church and you're having thoughts, mm -hmm. but they're not your thoughts. They're cl it's clear to you that God is speaking to you. Yeah. And I've had experiences like this. So I'm not, I'm not like, uh, there's no part of me that like questions that at all, actually. Um, what I'm interested in is have you found a way or is your faith created a space for that to not be like an event that happens every couple of years or, or, you know, every 10 years yeah. where that, yeah. that is a, a daily thing. I mean, cause that's really what we're, we're talking about here. Sure. And what's interesting to me is, Hey, I think probably everyone has had some kind of experience or at least experience with God, or at least what Virginia Woolf called moments of being, or yeah. just a moment where everything makes sense. I think everyone's had, at yeah. least had one of those, but I, I suspect that that channel is can be like a, a, a muscle that is worked out and with 100%. skill and practice that can be open more of the time, if not almost all of the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm fascinated and interested in what a life looks like lived from that place. Yeah. And because and it is the long winded answer, but or question. But you know, our, our society is, Ram Dass would say, is like a temple to the rational mind. Mm -hmm. You know, in your life, when you end up at the tree of life or in the mm -hmm. Times Square was, that's where your rational mind got you. Sure. And I think, I don't think the rational mind is evil, but I think it has a place. And for most of us, we're not using it, it's using us. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say the same thing that it's like, instead of being... Uh, a tool that we're meant to be, to have dominion over. Correct. That it can lord over us. And the most rational people can be a slave to rationale. Yes. And um, I would, I think I know what you're asking. Yeah, tell, and, well, I want to know how you, how you get that I get that voice of God. Yeah. More. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you some things that I've experienced and that one in a time of war, there are people on the front lines and there's people back at home and the people back at home will hear about the war. The people on the front lines actually get to see it. And I made a choice. I decided that I needed to be discipled. I, I signed up for the school that was very different. It was very different than, it, it was like the least echo chamber place that I could be. Uh, so absolutely foreign to um, my rational mind, uh, absolutely foreign to my life experience. But I chose to be around people that were different than me because I could see that there was a benefit that they were getting that I was lacking. Mm -hmm. And so 
I was willing to suspend my rationale to uh, to go and taste and see. And what I found, you know, I went on mission trips around the world. We went to areas where there is far greater faith in the supernatural than we have in this country. You know, like there's that um, that movie, The Devil's Advocate from like the 90s that um, that Al Pacino's character, the devil, says that the, the greatest uh, thing that he's pulled over on humanity is to get them to believe that he's not real. And, mm. you know, when you're in a place that has elevated uh, rationality above experience, you can live in a very detached, synthetic world where people spend a ton of time online in little echo chambers that uh, reinforce their predetermined beliefs. And they're not going to learn anything. They're just going to um, to echo it back to those that would hear. And if somebody ends up getting into that chamber that's from the outside, they'll just be treated like an outsider. But uh, what I found is when I went in and really like there's a, a prayer that that mentor taught me that he said, uh, you know, it's very hard to fill up a, f a cup that's full. So why don't we just pray uh, that God would enable us to set aside everything we think we know uh, about him, about ourselves, about this process and everything else that we would have an open mind and a new experience. And when I started with that, it, it helped just kind of clear, clear some space mm -hmm. um, to be able to receive and then going out and having like kind of frontliner experiences that, you know, I'm successful in my career. I could just like hang out in my nice house with my beautiful family and like call it a day. But on a daily basis, I choose to go be uncomfortable and go uh, do my best to try to help people that are asking for help. You know, and sometimes they're uh, homeless drug addicts. Sometimes they're couples whose marriage is falling apart. Sometimes they're people that have uh, severe physical infirmities or like what the world would tell you was profound mental illness. But instead of going and treating them with medication, instead of going in like being like, well, I don't have the tools to help you, like actually being on the front lines and believing that uh, prayer actually works, that God will actually show up in ways and praying for people, walking with them sometimes through a process of inner healing, sometimes a process of spiritual deliverance of like real life change and being willing to see see that out with them. Mm. I see things go from darkness to light all the time, but it's only because I'm on the front lines. I'm not just hearing about it at home. Mm. And if you're hearing about something secondhand or you're reading a book, but you're not actually like risking experience, then you're never going to experience the miraculous. You may be somewhat satisfied with uh, the belief system that you've already, like is already deeply entrenched in, you know, but if you're willing to be like, okay, God, please enable me to set aside every, about everything I think I know about you, myself, about everything so I can have an open mind and new experience and then let me help, let me go be helpful to people. It's, it's different. And there's two things that I'll mention in the Bible that I think you'll think are helpful. One is there's a, there's a verse in the book of Romans and Paul writes that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But in, in Greek, there's two words for word. One is logos, which is like the Bible, yeah. which is God's written word, but one is rhema and it's like what God is speaking. Okay. And in that scripture, it doesn't say faith comes by hearing and hearing by the written Bible. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing by experience, experiencing God's living word. Mm -hmm. It's rhema. It's not logos. It's uh, living. 
in Revelation, there's a scripture, one of my favorites that says uh, that the accuser, which is Satan, Satan, the word Satan means accuser. The accuser was overcome, cast down by the blood of the lamb and by the spoken word of their testimonies. That it's not just like one or the other, it's people that went and had this experience and then they were telling other people that they had this experience. And in that testimony is the spirit of prophecy because God's impartial. So he's if he's done it for one, he'll do it for all. And if people see a change, you know, it doesn't say anywhere, like go stand on the corner and like wave your Bible and scream at people. It says, go be the light. Mm. That your assignment is to go let your light so shine. And mm. it's not through your words, it's through your actions. Because people aren't going to be changed by you talking down to them. People are going to be changed when they see something that is so wholly different than what they've experienced. There's, um, you ever read any Richard Bach? Like he wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull. And yeah. He, okay. So the, his book Illusions, which was the first book of his that I read, it starts off with a parable. Uh, it, Illusions, it's like the something about a reluctant Messiah, but there's a story about yeah, a I've bunch of that creatures that live ago. on the bottom of a yeah. crystal river. And they, they, it says that there's like these creatures and their, their whole, their whole life is like clinging to these reeds at the bottom of this crystal river. But one day there was a cre creature that started to mature in this community. And he said, I actually think that the river knows where it's going. Right. Yeah, I, I think that. that this river actually desires to lift us free from these twigs that we're hanging on to. <laughs> if I'm forced to hang on to these reeds for the rest of my life, I'm going to die of boredom. And the creatures are like, look, if you let go of these reeds, this is all we do. This is like literally our <laughs> whole way of life. If you let go of these reeds, this current that you're worshiping is going to tumble and smash you against the rocks and you're going to die quicker than boredom. But he didn't heed their warning and one day decided to let go. And when he let go, he was immediately tumbled and smashed on the rocks. But as he refused to cling again, he was lifted free. And then to the creatures downstream, to whom he was a stranger, they said, look, Messiah, mm. a creature like us, but he flies. He's a Messiah. He's going to come save us all. And he said, no, 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 I'm not any more Messiah than you. The, the, it's the river that lifted me free. And it'll do the same for you if you'll just let go. But inevitably they wouldn't, they would just cling and then he would pass by and they were just left to make stories of a Messiah. And I used to use that story to discount Jesus, thinking that just like the creatures, I could let my, let, like, let go myself. And it was me letting go that was ultimately going to mm -hmm. determine my destination, that it was going to like free me, that I'd be able to uh, follow the noble eightfold path, that I'd be able to uh, release all of my attachment to the world, to rise above it and somehow become enlightened. What I found is on my own strength, trying to do that, like I could look like I was doing it, but it wasn't producing the results. Yeah. And what I found is there's a, a, a verse in Proverbs that says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And um, I had a huge problem with the word fear because I'm like, how am I supposed to fear and love or why would I fear somebody that loves me? You know, what does that mean? And I had a pastor tell me that the, the fear of God is not being terrified of him. It's actually like being terrified to live a life without him. Mm -hmm. And that practicing the fear of God is just making a decision to live as if the Bible were true, whether it makes sense to my rational mind or not. And instead of arguing about it, just experiencing it firsthand and then reporting back to people. Yeah. And when I made that decision to live as, this, as if this were true and sometimes having to wrestle with it, because you come up against like challenging stories. You come up against challenging stories like the book of Job. You come up against like challenging stories where it seems like uh, like Adam and Eve being exp 
uh, kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Mm. There's a lot of things that are are challenging, but when I've let like God come into that challenge and really prayed, like, show me what this is, he always has. And some of the deepest revelation that I've gotten, some of the times that I felt closest to God has been when I've come with a really genuine struggle and have made the decision in that struggle to be teachable. That my best preaching has come from that. The things that people have connected most have like come through that, but it's been like this, this wrestle. And I think, you know, that's the way it is with every parent child relationship that yeah. there's times where, you know, it seemed there were very many times where I thought my parents were dead wrong. But as I've matured, as I've grown, as I've become a parent, as I've become a provider, as I've become a husband, as I've become um, a, a business person, as I've like, I start to realize through experience the wisdom that my parents had. You know, I could be a, a like stand in opposition to like all of those things, but it's just I'm in opposition to like ideology. You start to get experience and especially if you start to stand on the front lines and are like, you know, when in places where God really needs to show up, I found that he does. And, you know, to like a long-winded way of answering your question, it's like, if you want to stay at home and try to come to an understanding before you do anything, if you want to keep yourself in like, you know, kind of an encapsulated, easy life where it's easy to kind of create your own worldview and live in an echo chamber. Great. But I think, you know, if you really want to change the world, and especially if you really want to see God move, get out a little bit. There's, um, in my, my Facebook is like a very funny place because <laughs> <laughs> they have not been able to figure out an algorithm for me that I haven't, like, I didn't go and defriend like all of my non-Christian friends when I became a Christian. So I've got like this melting pot of, you know, 3000 or so people on this platform where I kind of see it all. And I see, you know, recovery friends. I see uh, artists and musicians that I I grew up with, I see politically active friends, I see Christian friends, I see like a whole gamut of things. And sometimes I see people that if they would just give the other side a chance, they'd realize that they actually want the same things. Mm. But their language kind of confuses the whole argument and they just think they're like diametrically opposed to each other. And, um, you know, one, one side thinks that the other is the devil and the other side thinks that the other is the devil. And like, you know, if you can get the ideology out of it, you realize like m most people kind of want the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes what's prevents us from getting it is being really sure that we're right. I, and like you said earlier, that prevents us from experiencing God. Absolutely. Yeah, thinking and, you're right, thinking you know it. All. I mean, it's really powerful. Yeah. And I mean, like, I I don't, I try not to get into arguments with people. I don't always succeed, but I'm, I'm mostly good about it. Well, let me try to summarize your answer. Sure. Because it's really important and it was, it was powerful. I had goosebumps, you know, a lot of what you just shared. I asked you, how do we have a more open and direct and, and f frequent yeah. channel with God? And you said, A, pray that, you know, I, I can suspend my knowledge yeah. of God and everything so that something new can come in. You also said, Go where need where God needs to show up. Really powerful. Yeah. And you might just see that 
God does show up there. And what am I, what else am I missing? I think those are the biggest things. I mean, like if you can be the light, you also said. That's the other part. And, um, you know, by, by the way, mm -hmm. none of those things were what I was expecting you to say. Really? Yeah. I thought you might say like, you know, pray for 15 minutes in the morning or, it, you know. It, I think all practice, of the, like. Which all, is good, but, you know, it's. There's some, there's some practical things. Which is why it was powerful to me. Yeah. Because it was outside of what my knowledge, I yeah. guess. You know. I'll, I'll tell you that there are blocks. And I can, I can give you some of those that, um, because there are also times where like, I will not hear God. And, you know, the word inspiration. What about when you hear God and then you don't listen? Well, that can be part of the problem. You know, like the Bible says that God's word never returns void. So if he's given me an assignment and I've just been like, I'm not going to do that. I want something else. He may not speak again until I do what he first asked me to do. Mm. And um, not out of punishment, but just like, I already told you, you know. Yeah. And maybe the next thing that the next message or piece of inspiration that is going to come w would come wouldn't make sense without you doing the first thing. And a lot of times that's, that's the case, but the, you know, the inspiration is in spirit Asian. It's the outworking of an indwelling spirit. And I think that the reason that there are so many creative people that are tormented is because we have to be open in order to receive. But when you're deceived about like, what you're listening to spiritually, you know, you can go into a very, very dark place because you can be inspired by a dark spirit. And I think, you know, testing those things that you may feel like, oh gosh, I got this thing. I think it's from God. Well, yeah, test it. You know, if I believe, which I do, that the Bible is true, even the parts that make me uncomfortable and I don't understand, I believe that it's true. And, you know, for the people that believe that the Bible was somehow like passed around by an oral How do tradition. You test it? Is that what you're saying, telling me? Yeah. I mean, but it, the, the, there's like, and I'm not like, I read one translation. It's, I'm not like by no means like a Greek or a Hebrew scholar, but I have a Greek interlinear. I have a Hebrew interlinear. I have like a number of different translations. Different translations were translated for different purposes. There's some that are like word for word translations. There are some that are thought for thought, some that are paraphrased, some that like seek to, to preserve the uh, poetic nature yeah. of, and you don't really get a full picture unless you're willing to like line those up side by side, really pray, really ask, really press in to, um, to listening to God. And then sometimes like looking at commentary, what have like, mm -hmm. what have the men of God of tradition over time said about this? There's sometimes where I've gotten inspiration where of like, and what I've seen in, uh, in what they've seen has been different, but I, it's like facets of the same thing, but it's not like exactly the same thing. And I think that that kind of grows in, in maturity. Mm -hmm. But if I believe that the word of God is like, if I believe the, the Bible is the word of God and I don't believe that God is going to contradict himself, if I'm getting inspired to do something that contradicts his word, I'm just going to assume that it's not from him. Got it. So what you're you're clarifying that not all inspiration comes from God. Yeah. Yeah, got it. And you look at like um some art is very dark. But it's dark in a way that it doesn't transmit light in any form. It's cynical, it's bitter, it's not joy bringing. If it brings introspection, it doesn't bring introspection that's leading towards light. It's mm. like leading towards darkness. Mm. That there's comedy that's like that. That I have some very good friends that are, are stand-up comics and I've spent a lot of time around uh, comics and there's some that are tormented. What the world connects to in their comedy is their pain. It's like 
trauma bonding. Mm -hmm. It's not leading towards light. There's other ones where it's like, gosh, I feel so uplifted after that show. But can it be dark and lead to light? I think it just is, it's a case by case thing because sometimes it's like, you know, you go into the darkness to clean it out. And ultimately it's the cleaning out of the darkness that lets the light in, but it's ultimately light bringing. Yeah. I think we talked about this the first time we met. Yeah. That sometimes I look at, um, not just a single piece from an artist, but their the arc of their whole life. Mm -hmm. And they might go on a journey similar in some ways to your life story. Sure. Where, hey, that first album was dark. Yeah. The second one was dark. <laughs> the third one was dark. But then you get to the light later in the career and actually the fourth or fifth album of light or yeah. fourth or fifth painting or whatever um, actually... Is yeah. more inspiring because it was preceded by darkness. But I think for most of the fans of those artists, like they can appreciate their earlier work, but they're not going to necessarily listen to it on repeat. We've talked, I've like many friends that are musicians that are like, ah, I wouldn't necessarily start with that album. Maybe maybe try this, you yeah, know, I or actually tell like, people hey, that, you know, I tell people that when I, that I meet them now, when I'm, yeah. I'm, I think I have 13 albums now. Yeah. And I say, you know, if I meet someone new that hasn't heard of me, you yeah. know, say, and they'll say, what do you do? I think Mike Posner, I'm, I'm an artist. They say, well, oh, what's your name? Mike Posner. And I say, but if you listen to my stuff, listen to a real good kid and then listen to it, keep going, you know, yeah. it's like, and so, <laughs> and so, yeah, I identify with that. Like, yeah. start there. That's well, because it's more true to who I am now. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I, but there's a maturity because there are some artists. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine the other night and she is, um, she's like a heavy rock girl, but she has like a lot of like uh, very dark. She's thrown into a category with a lot of very dark music. Okay. And, you know, that's her livelihood but she also feels like you know there's a a story of this de demon possessed man the demoniac of the gatherings that jesus delivers and when he's delivered a thousand demons are in a legion of demons that right. go like jump off the cliff and in pigs um when that guy got delivered he's like jesus i just want to be your student i just want to follow you i just want to like go to bible school i just want to like i uh, be one of your disciples and jesus told him no jesus said stay here this is where you're known. This is where you need to stay. Mm. And as a result, that whole region, the Decapolis that he lived in was radically transformed because there were people that knew him there. And he wasn't like meant to go away. It was like his transformation was so profound that people needed to see. They were like, you were dangerous. You were a menace. And look at you. Yeah. There has to be a God. And that wasn't everybody's call, but it was his. And I was talking to this girl, uh, her name's Dorothy, about this. And she has a band called Dorothy, but she's uh, she's like on this uh, cruise right now that's like a... like A darkness cruise. Yeah. <laughs> and there's like a lot of, I mean, like, you know, the the poster for this this cruise is like a bunch of like this in a very dark, yeah. you know, and there's like a skeleton or something. But um, she's like, I don't know, you know, and she's like a recent Christian, but it's like a, kind of like a Kat Von D kind of transformation where it's like profound and, uh, and she's kind of figuring it out. And I think the unfortunate thing about a lot of Christians is like when they have that experience, if it's just kind of like a one-off like moment with God that it transforms their whole life. It sends them on a trajectory that is markably different than where they were at before. Mm -hmm. But they haven't really been like brought up. They haven't been discipled. They're like babies in a lot of ways. They've got a lot of people that are like in the world that aren't Christians at all, but they don't know how to explain what just happened to them. So they end up not usually coming off very well. I ran into that problem where I tried to explain yeah. things that I didn't yet have an explanation for and I failed. And, uh, but a lot of times, you know, people will be like 
eight, nine, ten years Christian, and suddenly they live in a Christian ghetto where they're completely separated by yeah, and um, they can't be of human usefulness to anybody, and they're not really on the front lines anymore, and so they may be having their own like, you know, blissful experience in their quiet time with God, but their quiet time isn't resulting in like a changed life where other people are seeing them and saying, "What's up with that guy?" There's something about it. I love this so much because, you know, you always hear, you're the five people, you know, you are your five closest friends. And and I just see a lot in my community of this sort of um, dropping of people. Yeah. Going, hey, like, I, I, I made a step in my spiritual life or my, or my business life, whatever, in any part of my life, I've leveled up. And so now... I'm going to delete all of my friends and my community and just hang out with the new community that I, that I may have just kind of sure. either thrust myself into or been thrust into. And I don't like that at all. You know, I, I, I love this idea that, that you're talking about, which is you're now evidence of a, of a transformation. You're now evidence that there's more that you're now living, breathing evidence that someone else could change their life. And the worst thing you could do is now isolate yourself and try to sure. only be around people that, but that like, are like who you exactly are, who you think you are. You know what I mean? But it's what we started talking about. It's kind of that burn it down, you know, and it's like, I'm going to. It's another form of the burn it, it down. It is another form of the burn it down. And it's a sneaky it, form of burn it down. Yeah, but it, it's it's inherently immature. Because it feels like building up, but it's uh -huh. not. But it, the truth is, if you're actually strong, then like nothing's going to be a threat to you. Right. But if you're like, I need to be away from this. And sometimes it's healthy to like step back and reflect and be like, I'm just going to, I'm going to go like spend a little time in the desert. I'm going to go on a walkabout. I'm sure. going to go like take a step back to actually like reflect and get some perspective on my life. But it's the staying away that I think is, is a bigger problem. And it's to me, usually evidence of people not really doing the work of like healing themselves and healing relationships. And there's a very like deep, immaturity that can last a lifetime if you allow it to you know it, and this is where i think like uh, aa is so beautiful when it's practiced properly if people going back to the darkest parts of their past and making amends to people that they've harmed and i think if it's practiced right that they can go back to somebody that's 95 percent at fault and them only being 5% at fault, but being committed to cleaning up 100% of their 5% and leaving that other 95% to God, whether yeah. he chooses to like fix it or not. And when you do that, you start to have a real life of integrity. And people will see that light. They may not agree with it on principle. They may not uh, understand it but they'll respect it ultimately when they see it lived out. And it's, um, I think in some ways there's like a little bit of a balance because, you know, you can take that saying that you're like the, the sum of the five people you hang out with the most. And, and there are some people that I deeply love that I would never accept advice from. Yes. Because I don't like the results that they're getting in their life. Yeah. Why would you ask someone for advice when you... No. It's and, like going to somebody that's been divorced five times and asking them for like yeah. relationship advice. I mean, that's just... <laughs> it's silly. Um, but it doesn't mean I don't love them. Yeah. And, you know, I think that there, there are important relationships for every man to have, that it's important to have somebody that's been a little bit further down the path than you that can be a type of mentor uh that can give some guidance that can give 
some real world experience based on success in something that you're yeah. currently in the middle of. Um, it's important to have people that you're pouring into, that you're investing in the next generation, that you're being to them what your guy is to you. And then it's also important to have peers that are like living it out in real time. But this is where I think, you know, I have had to really fight for my peer relationships because I understood very early on that it was important for me to have like somebody ahead of me and like mm -hmm. being, you know, indoctrinated into 12 step recovery as a 16 year old kid and like growing up, I, in that fellowship, like I always had to have a sponsor. I always had to have a mentor, like somebody that had gone before. Mm -hmm. um, the guy that I got when I was 10 years sober though, he really helped me out. He was like, look, I've been married three times. Uh, I don't actually believe that I have a fourth in me. I, I have like worked on myself. I've done therapy. I've done inner child work. I've done all sorts of things. And I think a lot of the trauma that I experienced as a child and some of these deeply ingrained things, I don't know if they'll ever leave me, but I don't want to put another woman through mm. my undealt with issues. So I'm not your guy when it comes to relationship advice. I can show you places where I've had success, but I'm not going to try to pretend that I'm your one-stop shop. Go find a guy that is not addicted to porn, not sleeping around, not like doing all of these things. Find a guy that has like the kind of relationship that you yeah. want and then ask them how they become successful in it. That's like wisdom, but you're not going to get it from me. So go get it from somebody else. And you're probably not going to find that guy at like evening AA meetings because most guys that have successful relationships and families are at home with their families at night. You know, you might find them at like a morning AA meeting or lunchtime or something, but probably not at night all the time. And I was like, oh, that's great. You know, and, but the, the peer relationships that, you know, as I've, I've grown and like, um, owning businesses and creating art and writing and doing all like having a family and doing all the things that I do that like being intentional, it's like, uh, being intentional about like eating or exercise. It's like any area that requires intention that it's easy to make excuses as to why there's, you know, I'm not going to make time for this person now. I'll get to it later. Mm -hmm. But I think the peers are the ones that are the most important. But it's very important that they're on mission with you. Like, I don't get confused about people that are my true peers and people whose position that, like, who who's, like, I, the position that I hold in their life is to pour into them. That it doesn't mean that I'm not very close with, like, some of the guys that I'll mentor. But there's a distinction between like those guys and the guys that I go to when the wheels are falling off, when I like really need somebody that I know has fruit in their life, but I know is like running in a parallel lane at a similar speed to me mm -hmm. that I don't have to like pre-explain, you know, all of this stuff. And I'm not like processing down, if that makes sense, yes. where mm -hmm. like Perfect I'm going to like overwhelm. They're not going to be overwhelmed by what I'm going through because we're on, we're kind of on mission together. And, you know, there's times in life where you, uh, I think saying you outgrew somebody is, can be kind of dismissive, but I don't know that there's like a better term, but you haven't like grown together and you've kind of grown in different paths. So they may not have the same position in your life that they used to. It doesn't yeah. mean that like, I don't have love for them. I don't want to spend yeah, yeah, time yeah. with them, but like. Thank you for that um, addition of nuance to what I was saying earlier, yeah. because it, it is, it is a, relationships change over time. And so it's not as clear as, hey, hey these are my five friends for life now. Or yeah, that. yeah. And you want to be able to have all three of those, you know, types of relationships and ultimately get to a place in your one spiritual growth, which what I hear from you is where you don't have to, you know, isolate yourself in fear because 
hey, if I'm around, if I come across X, Y, or Z type of person on the street, it's going to mess up my vibe, you know? And Yeah, that's ridiculous. I, well, I meet a lot of people like that and I felt like that at times in my life, yeah. you know, especially when you get a taste of the transcendent, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe that comes from hopping over the fence. Yeah. You know, you get a taste of God and you're like, hey, that was really powerful. I want more of that. Anyone that's going to mess up me tasting that, go away. Yeah. And then you can you have a really small life. I ask every guest this. If God was whispering in your ear right now, and I believe he is, um, one thing for you, Morgan, to remember, what would that be? I would think it would be uh, and what this has meant has meant um, different things over the course of my my life, especially in like the time that I've really been intentional about following him. But it's it's to stay focused. That um, this year, uh, I always try to consider what a vision for the year looks like. And this year, it's about... Uh, intersecting lines where there's a big picture vision which is like a river but there's tributaries that are contributing to the river so it doesn't mean that I have to be like being on task all the time you know there's but it's also knowing that I only have I uh, like all of us have a limited amount of time here. And I believe that like we're meant to be effective. So I don't get religious about it where I think that uh, if I need to uh, go shoe shopping or go play Pokemon Go or something to like get my uh, mind off of something that that is necessarily taking away from me being on on task but um i've just been very aware of not wanting to waste time to be uh clear about what i'm being called to do and where i'm going to make the greatest impact uh, in the lives of my kids in uh, my relationship with my wife in the various roles that I play uh, in organizations and in people's lives, that I want to be purposeful about what I do. And um, there's a scripture about running your race well, not having to run somebody else's race. You know, you've got your race to run, but run it in a way that you intend on winning the prize. Like, don't just run it for the sake of running it, run it to win. And I don't look at that like I'm in competition with people. It's more just like, okay, I realize that there is a finite amount of life that I'm going to live. And I want that life to be meaningful, not just for for me so I can like flex and think I'm all that, but like so that I've left a meaningful impact that the world is a better place because I lived here. And um, I think it's like a kind of a testing word in some ways of like, is this something that's going to bring light? Is this something that's going to have a net benefit? Is this something that I could just delegate to somebody else and bless them with the opportunity rather than doing it myself? Um, is this person that's like asking for my time or asking for my counsel, you know, is this, uh, is this an open heart and an open mind that will actually like take that investment where it'll bear fruit or mm. are they just looking for me to co-sign something that they've already decided to do, right. you know? And so I think about those things, you know, and I especially think about like, I have a six year old little boy named Jack and, um, he is built like me 
he asks a lot of questions. He is very smart and um, and he is wonderful. And I want um, to be the father for him that I didn't have. Mm. Uh, I want him to know that uh, how much I love him and how he can come to me with like absolutely anything. And I'll like uh, never reject him, but I'll always help him through it. You know, all of those those things. And like my beautiful daughter, Ella, she is so creative and so brilliant. And I, I mean, she's like a really, really exceptional artist where she doesn't draw the things that the other kids draw. She never has. She draws these like really epic little characters that are detailed and fun. And she has such a rich inner life where um, she can play by herself for hours and she loves other people, but she doesn't need them to be around. And I want to like foster her gifts as much as I possibly can. And, uh, you know, my wife, like every relationship that I had was a build up to conquest and then this downward spiral to it not working out. And, uh, I found that, you know, in order to develop real intimacy, um, there has to be vulnerability met with empathy. And when you start to find that in a relationship and realize that you're not ever going to be perfect going into it, but you're on this like ride of being perfected and growing together over a lifetime, that if you can decide to stay vulnerable, and let that vulnerability be met with empathy on the other side. And when that other person is empathetic or vulnerable, that you can be empathetic to them, then this intimacy is like a ever deepening well. And, uh, you know, I want my kids to be able to see uh, the love that I live out for their mom as being inspiring. So that means that I have to say no to stuff. And, uh, but I don't just arbitrarily say no, I weigh it of like, is this going to help me run my, run my the race that I've been assigned to run well? And, um, and to not worry about uh, when I have to say no, or when I have to like redirect a little bit but that's been like, you know, something that God has definitely been speaking to me in real time. And, um, and I don't like beat myself up about not being perfect. Like, but it's like, you know, having intention about something is, uh, I think ultimately how you end up growing and then seeing, you know, by being on the front lines and having that intention in my life, like those, those real moments with God of being able to, to be on like kind of a perpetual take your kid to work day with him and uh, and seeing his work be done on mm. the earth, you know, sometimes through my life. And um, what a great metaphor. Yeah. I love that. Me too. If, if you had one thing for me to remember, what would it be? I would say test your thoughts. that there are some things that are like good thoughts and there are some things that are God thoughts and something, you know, sometimes can seem very good, but it doesn't produce a long-term goodness that, uh, you know, like even lying can give you short-term benefit of like avoiding discomfort or, right, right, right. you know, but, uh, long-term, you know, it steals your ability to connect and makes you, uh, suspicious and all of those other things. Right. It's like not healthy. So, you know, I look at that with opportunities and with thoughts that I've just gotten in a habit of being very intentional about testing my thoughts and like being around other people that can help me with that. Not just letting anybody speak into my life, but, you know, not being rude about the people that aren't invited to hold that position, but like uh, being like, hey, thanks for sharing. And then like, all right. Um, <laughs> I had one of those the other day. Yeah. A guy can start coaching me. Like, yeah. 
how do I know you again? <laughs> yeah, I'm not looking for I'm not looking for that. I got that already. But the uh, you know, not necessarily cutting myself off from like being able to receive, but just testing. You know, is this good fruit? Or if I'm making an investment, is this good soil? Mm. Am I sowing a seed in somewhere that's just like the seed may sprout up and just die as quickly as it sprouted up? Or is mm. this something where it's like, no, this person's made this investment in really being open and like they're asking very intentionally for some help with that. Like I'll always, you know, when, or at least whenever possible, invest into something like that. But it's the testing the thoughts, especially, you know, as you're exploring faith, you know, and like being gracious sometimes with people that are at a different stage of their journey that maybe um, have to kind of hide out in like a little bit of a proverbial desert for a bit to get away from the the noise of the city. Mm. But, um, you know, I find that like when I'm running my race well, I become a lot less concerned with how people are running theirs. And um, just a lot better equipped to be able to like... Uh, see and give good counsel when I'm invited to. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. You got it.